Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to session number 17, Chemistry of New Nanomedicines with Invicleaner. My name is Rudolf Sentel, and together with Matthias Bartz, we are sharing this session. And I want to hand over the presentation at first to Professor Daniel Sigward, from, uh, who is a professor at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center. And he's interested in the use of material chemistry to solve challenges in disease therapy and diagnosis. Uh, Daniel, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, please. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to be here with everyone virtually uh, coming from Dallas, Texas in the United States. Today, I will be talking about CRISPR-Cas, which is just an extraordinary and amazing collection of molecular editing machines. They use RNA-guided DNA nucleases coupled with single-guide RNAs and donor DNA to edit or correct disease-causing mutations. As you're all likely aware, this technology was awarded the Nobel Prize a few weeks ago to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. Uh, following this win, uh, they conducted many interviews, and I noted a question put forth to Professor Jennifer Doudna uh, from Future Human Medium. What do you think is going to be the biggest obstacle to getting these treatments to patients? And she replied, it's probably delivery. Uh, that's a hard challenge right now. And indeed, this is the area that we have focused, because if we think about the ways we have, the tools we have available to deliver nanomedicines. Um, right now, liver hepatocyte is the primary target for nanoparticles such as alnylums on patro, an siRNA-based uh, nanoparticle, or uh, gaunac and other conjugates that the liver is an accessible organ. But as we envision the future of genomic medicines, whether they be messenger RNA protein replacement, siRNA-mediated silencing, CRISPR-Cas gene editing, they're obviously targets for human disease in all of these different parts of the body. And this is particularly true for CRISPR-Cas gene editing because you would want to edit the cell that's carrying the mutated protein that's causing the disease, uh, but not edit the other cells of the body that are, um, would lead to off-target events and potentially dire consequences. So this is the challenge that we've been focused on for the last five to 10 years. And I'm excited today to report a technology we're calling um, SORT. Um, to get our heads in, in, in a good framework for this presentation, uh, I'll be describing a general concept called the lipid nanoparticle. Um, this you may be familiar with as a part of alnylums on patro, again, this siRNA medicine, um, or you might have read in the news uh, the development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines from Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, CureVac, uh, wonderful companies that are developing messenger RNA vaccines for SARS-2 that will be injected in probably some of our arms in a couple of months, uh, carried inside of a lipid nanoparticle. In this particular case, we are using, uh, sorry. In this particular case, we are using uh, nanoparticles that uh, require an ionizable cationic lipid. Um, here we're using 5A2SC8, which is a uh, lipid that we discovered and developed a few years ago. It has an ionizable amine-based core, a degradable ester linkage, and a hydrophobic periphery that allows one to encapsulate and deliver negatively charged nucleic acids. This is in combination with a zwitterionic phospholipid, cholesterol, and a lipid PEG that are rapidly combined with nucleic acid, uh, typically an acidic buffer designed to protonate the nitrogens in the carrier molecule. This allows for self-assembly into controlled monodisperse 50 to 100 nanometer nanoparticles that can mediate cellular delivery of nucleic acids. Uh, the, as I introduce SORT, I would like to share um, two observations, uh, one of you know, many that led to the development of SORT. Um, one of these is that as we study the role of what each of these different lipids are doing inside of synthetic nanoparticles, we realize that it could be advantageous to combine the chemistry of the zwitterionic phospholipid and the chemistry of the ionizable cationic lipid into a single molecule that could form three component nanoparticles 
to deliver complex nucleic acids and form a better nanostructured nanoparticle. This was very effective for transfer RNA that will go into the clinic next year and uh, gave us a very surprising result. When we delivered luciferase encoding messenger RNA, we observed multi-organ tropism. And when we attempted gene editing in these reporter mice, we saw gene editing events in the kidneys, lungs, spleen, and liver. Um, so although at the time we did not understand why and how this was happening, it showed that it was possible to use nanoparticles to deliver to different tissues. The second observation came from a high throughput screen of polymer-based polyplexes uh, designed where we wanted to internalize and deliver nanomedicines to cancer cells, but not normal cells. And we used cancer and normal cells derived from a single patient where they have the same genetic background and were able to discover a polyplex nanoparticle that did not internalize in normal cells, but did rapidly internalize in cancer cells leading to cytotoxic death. And these nanoparticles stayed in tumors for weeks, whereas non-selective nanoparticles uh, went away uh, in six hours. So here too, we didn't really have the full mechanism uh, but we saw that it was possible to simply use chemistry to control uh, tissue tropism. So here in the remainder of my time, I would like to introduce um, SORT, which is standing for a selective organ targeting. Um, it begins with a traditional four component LNP. And in a number of papers, we showed that the ratio and, and amounts of these different molecules that self-assemble together into the nanoparticle is critical to form the nanostructure and mediate effective delivery of nucleic acids. So first idea is we did not want to disrupt this essential balance of these molecules that assemble around the RNA to deliver it. But we hypothesized that we could add a supplemental fifth molecule, one, two, three, four, five, and that this fifth molecule could serve as a tuning molecule that would not disrupt the ability to deliver nucleic acid, but would change the physiochemical properties in a way that the body perceives it in a different way. And we found that introduction of permanently cationic lipids allows one to redirect nanoparticles to the lungs and mediate messenger RNA delivery exclusively in lung tissues. Incorporation of an anionic lipid as the fifth molecule mediates uh, selective delivery of nucleic acids to the spleen and uh, incorporation of additional ionizable cationic lipids actually enhanced liver delivery, where the starting formulation delivered to 45% of hepatocytes and the sort LNP for liver delivers to nearly 100% of all cells in the liver. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, here we're using 5A2SC8, DRPE, cholesterol, lipid peg, and we've added DOTAP as a very classically long-standing uh, reference cationic lipid from zero to 100%. So we can see that the molecular relationship of these particles um, does look very different than a traditional or classic LNP. Um, in doing so, we recognize that as we incorporated this DOTAP into the five component LNP, the expression of the luciferase protein uh, following intravenous administration at a low dose uh, started in the liver. And as we added DOTAP started to migrate to the spleen and went to the lungs uh, maximally at 50% uh, incorporation. So this was really exciting because it gives a way, a very systematic way to have exclusive liver, spleen, or lung delivery, um, or to dial in a mixture of the different organs if that were to be the desire for the therapy. Uh, we next investigated what would happen if we included the opposite electronic character. So we incorporated a negatively charged lipid and found that this delivers nucleic acid exclusively to the spleen, including T cells and B cells and therapeutically relevant populations with maximal expression around 30% incorporation. As mentioned, incorporation of an ionizable lipid such as DODAP uh, led to an enhancement of liver delivery reaching um, saturated luminescence at 20% incorporation. So here we now have this way to uh, deliver nucleic acids to different tissues. And we wondered if this could be a universal generalizable approach. At the outset of my presentation, I referenced on Patro, which is Alnylam's FDA approved nanoparticle for delivery of siRNA. Here we downloaded the label from the US FDA website 
and use the exact chemicals in that drug product to reproduce it, except that we replace the siRNA with a messenger RNA. That nanoparticle indeed delivers nucleic acid to the liver as we expect. And what's great about SORT is that this, can, this concept can be applied to on patrio to redirect messenger RNA delivery to the lungs um, or to the spleen. We've done this now with a variety of different nanoparticles and it does seem to be a universal feature. We did have some questions about it. Um, did we, for example, turn on the camera at just the right moment to capture these images? Therefore, we looked at three hours, eight hours, 24 hours, a variety of time points, and found that the tissue tropism occurs rapidly and is maintained throughout time. In the remaining minutes, I'll talk about some examples of gene editing. The first takes place in a, a genetically engineered mouse where we uh, have expression of a LOX, stop LOX, TD tomato cassette. Uh, what this means is the mice has the capacity to make a red fluorescent protein, uh, but it's turned off by this stop sign. Here we co-deliver Cas9 messenger RNA encoding for Cas9 protein with single guide RNAs that load into the Cas9 and edit the stop. So upon deletion in the liver, lungs, or spleen, one is able to turn on red fluorescence in these targeted organs. We use confocal microscopy and uh, flow cytometry to quantify which cell types and what percentage of cell types are transfected with this technology. The liver is you know, massively throughout the liver, it's visible by the naked eye, and the lungs, to our delight, uh, reached both the endothelium coming from the blood side all the way to the epithelium, which is the airway side. We are currently investigating these nanoparticles for correction of lung diseases, including cystic fibrosis, due to the capacity to reach the airway from the blood. In the context of the spleen, we see B cells, T cells, macrophages, and we're currently using SORT to look at immune uh, therapies. Um, finally, I'd like to highlight another very attractive cardiovascular disease target, which is PCSK9, um, a clinical target now in phase three trials for different uh, approaches. Here we're using CRISPR, which could potentially be a one-time injection for human beings someday. And we've used the CRISPR lung sort nanoparticles to edit the DNA for this particular gene. And uh, from DNA sequencing, we see about 50 to 60% deletion of this gene at the genomic level. And that leads actually to complete knockout of this uh, protein associated with high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. Using Western blot of extracted tissues or an ELISA to measure PCSK9 in the serum, we can no longer detect this uh, protein anymore. So really provide uh, CRISPR in combination with these sort nanoparticles provides a very powerful approach to do organ and cell selective gene editing. I'll just finish by acknowledging that this technology can also be applied to creation of tumor models. So here we've injected once to induce a chromosomal rearrangement between EML4 and ALK. It makes an oncogenic fusion protein and leads to cancer. So in addition to correcting diseases, this may be a very valuable tool for researchers to model uh, cancer targets of their interest. Um, so I'd just like to close by saying that building on the clinical success of RNAi, I think there's actually a great future for genomic medicines. Um, and then acknowledge my lab, particularly Tuo Wei and Chong Chang, uh, for their efforts on these projects on SORT. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Again, delighted to be here virtually. Okay. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, chat? Mm -hmm. you know, so, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> I can hear you. The problem Great. is, in the moment, I do not get the um, uh, streaming, streaming. Damn it. I cannot get access to the questions. Oh yeah, I have maybe this is 
One thing, I have a, a short question for you. Can you hear me? This is yeah. from Lutz Noon. I think you know him. I do. He says, thanks for a great talk. How much will the physical properties influence the joint charge when varying the fifth lipid of sort? Yeah, interestingly, if we take, for example, the uh, sort LNP for lungs, where we add the permanently cationic lipid, the surface charge is neutral uh, until we exceed about 65% incorporation of the, the lipid. So that means that the molecules are buried in the interior of the nanoparticle that are protected by this lipid peg anchor. So what we've shown recently in unpublished work is that some of the peg lipid is displaced um, in the serum after intravenous administration, and that leads to exposure of some of these groups. So they, um, they're very important. They're playing a, a specific role in protein recognition for protein corona formation, um, but they're neutral in charge you know, until the time when that happens. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just have another question. Maybe it fits in. So it's also from Michael, Michael Keller. Michael Keller, that's very exciting. What's the mechanism behind this tissue the specific redirection by altering the charges of uh, overall lipid nanoparticles? Is there anything known? Yeah, we, we were, were putting together a manuscript on this topic. Um, you know, very briefly, there are a few hallmarks for liver targeting formulations. Uh, number one, they go to the liver <laughs> because they look like VLDL nanoparticles. Number two, they have PKA about 6.4. And number three, they typically absorb apolipoprotein E to interact with LDL receptor. Um, so we've investigated these lines and found that sort LNPs for liver and lungs do not obey any of those three <laughs> criteria. Um, they go to different tissues, they have different physical property, and they bind different proteins uh, for a protein corona. So at, at a minimum, those are three elements that are causing these to deliver nucleic acid to different tissues. Okay, thank you very much. And as we said at the beginning, we will try if there are more questions to find a way to meet afterwards in a discussion room. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I want to come now to the second speaker of this afternoon session. This is Professor Julian Nicolas. He is a CNRS Director of Research at University Paris Sud. And his topics are, what he calls his research topics, are orthogonal functionalization of biodegradable nanoparticles, polymer products for cancer therapy, and reversible deactivation, radical polymerization, mechanism and synthesis of innovative biomaterials. So Daniel, could you please start your session here? Hello? Okay, do you hear me? It's okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So thanks a lot for, for having me. Thanks for your invitation. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of our work uh, focused on the design of well-defined polymer product conjugate for uh, cancer therapy. Um, so as you know, uh, there have been a lot of different uh, polymer nanoparticles uh, created uh, in the field of nanomedicines. Uh, there have been a lot of promising results, even clinical trials, and I just depict here the main features uh, of those systems. Uh, so they are made of uh, biodegradable, or at least uh, biocompatible polymers, uh, in which uh, the drug is physically encapsulated. You can also uh, make them stills, so make them long circulating, by simply grafting uh, at the surface some uh, uh, flexible and autophilic polymers, such as uh, polythene glycol, for instance. And you can also perform active targeting by coupling at their surface some uh, ligands that will be further recognized by uh, some receptors that are expressed as face of cancer cells. So, however, uh, there are still some important limitations. Uh, there are three, actually. Uh, the first one is burst release. The second one is some trouble to encapsulate some polysoluble drugs in the, into the polymer matrix. And the, uh, the third one, uh, which is very really important, is that you often have some poor drug loadings generally a few weight percent. So it means that you have to inject a lot of nanoparticles to expect uh, a therapeutic effect. So those uh, issues uh, can be, um, let's say, tackled by uh, taking inspiration from the product concept. 
So what is uh, a polymer prodrug? It's basically when you establish a link between a drug uh, and the polymer. So that way you don't have any burst release. You can force the compatibility between the drug and the polymer, and you can that way increase uh, the drug loadings. So uh, there are different ways to uh, synthesize polymer prodrug. Uh, the most famous one is the grafting two approach, which is basically when you graft a polymer uh, drug to a preformed polymer. This is the, the, the important work of Kataoka, for instance, of Kopechek. Uh, and in our group, we are trying to do things a little bit differently. So instead of coupling the drug to a preformed polymer, we basically synthesize the polymer in situ by growing it uh, from the drug. So how do we do that? We start from a drug and then we link a drug to an initiating moiety to perform control recopromization. So that way, uh, from this uh, drug initiator adduct, we start and we initiate <clears throat> and control the permeization of vinyl monomers to obtain some well-defined drug polymer uh, prodrugs. So the method is quite simple. It's a simple structure, just one drug attached at the extremity of a small uh, polymer chain. There are only a few synthetic steps with high yield. The method is also quite flexible because since we use control copolymerization, we can tune the polymer chain length and you will understand that the shorter the polymer chain is, the higher the drug loading is. And the method is quite, is quite versatile because we can play with both the nature of the drug, the nature of the linker between the drug and the polymer that governs the drug-based kinetics, and also play with the nature of the polymer, either hydrophobic, hydrophilic. So that way we uh, can have access to different kinds of uh, polymer prodrugs with different features that can uh, either be uh, formulated into drug polymer prodrug nanoparticles without any surfactants, is really important here. We can also encapsulate those conjugate into, I would say, more regular nanoparticles, like for instance, PLA PEG nanoparticles. Or if the polymer is water soluble, we can obtain some water soluble uh, polymer prodrugs that can be uh, injected uh, like this. So just the first example. Uh, since the first example we uh, reported in this field, we use gemstabine, which is a water-soluble anti-cancer drug, and then we link this drug to uh, uh, nacloxyamine, which is basically a two-in-one molecule that will be uh, that will both initiate and control the polymerization of the monomers by using this uh, moiety, which is a nitroxide called AG1, that will be the controlling agent and help to control the polymer chain and, and have, um, let's say, well-defined uh, polymer chains. So we polymerize isoprene, uh, that is a, a good mimic of uh, natural um, terpenoids, and we obtain a small library of gemstabine polyisoprene that were further formulated into narrowly dispersed uh, polyprodrug nanoparticles. So as you can see here, we targeted the really low molecular weight, and that way we we're able to obtain really high drug loadings, uh, minimum 10%, up to more than 30% if we decrease even further uh, the uh, polymer chain uh, length. So it means that we obtain uh, drug loadings that are much higher than, uh, uh, I would say, a lot of different drug loaded nanoparticles, where the drug is just physically uh, encapsulated. And particles that were obtained were already dispersed with diameters uh, in the 130, uh, 160 nanometers. We perform in vitro cytotoxy assays that were all uh, successful in different cancer cell lines, and then we moved to in vivo experiments uh, on tumor being mice. And we're quite happy to see that in the case of our polymer prodrug nanoparticles, we're able to uh, significantly reduce the uh, tumor growth comparatively to uh, control experiments, either untreated mice, mice treated with the free drugs, or mice treated with the drug-free uh, polyisoprene nanoparticles. We also observed that in the case of uh, our treatments, the mice uh, had a constant weight, conversely to uh, mice treated with the free drug that start to be uh, toxic uh, to the mice. So as I told you, this method is quite versatile, so we applied it to different polymers and different drugs. For instance, we applied it to polyscorin metacrylate instead of polyisoprene, so it's a metacrylate backbone with some squalene painting moieties, squalene being a natural lipid, so we thought it could be interested to, to prepare a, a polymers that contains natural lipid moieties, and we also obtained, obtained some significant in vivo efficacy. efficacy. We also applied it to another water-soluble uh, anti-cancer drug called cadribine. In that case, we perform a structure activity relationship to try to develop uh, the optimal uh, structures by changing the nature of the linker. Here it's a methylated ester group, here it's a diglycolic group, so a much more labeled group. And we were happy to discover that this structure was the most efficient one, the one with the diglycolic linker, uh, which is more labeled and that induced uh, a much higher drug release and, and that led to the, the, the smallest uh, IC50 uh, values. 
so not only we can apply it to uh, water-soluble uh, anti-cancer drugs, but also to hydrophobic anti-cancer drugs. So we use Pachytaxel as a model uh, hydrophobic anti-cancer drugs. And with Pachytaxel, uh, from this drug, we grew either hydrophobic polyisoprene with a diglycolic linker. In that case, we also obtain by uh, formulation, by representation, without any surfactant, some really stable and not really dispersed nanoparticles, which was a bit surprising because in that case, there is no hydrophilic moieties, uh, there is no charge, but uh, particles that were obtained were really dense and really compact, and, and that were really stable. And we also grew uh, some polypagmetacolate to obtain some nanoparticles with a core composed of pachytaxel moieties surrounded uh, with polypagmetacolate uh, chains. And in both cases, we obtain uh, cytotoxicity uh, properties that were uh, cooperative, that were um, similar to that uh, of the free drugs. So it means that in both cases, uh, there was a massive uh, drug release uh, from, the, from the polymer. So instead of growing uh, polymers from drugs, we also grew polymers from a frisson probe to obtain fluorescently labeled nanoparticles. So we grew polyisoprene from naphthalamide in, uh, by uh, nitroxide mediated polymerization in the same way. And we co precipitated uh, with cadamine uh, polyisoprene prodrugs to obtain some mixed nanoparticles comprising some fluorescent moieties uh, together with uh, drugs uh, attached to the polymer. And the particles were able to be uh, nicely followed by a microscopy. And so recently, uh, we uh, discovered something that we think is interesting and important. Uh, from Pectaxel, we grew uh, a polyacrylamide, which is a really hydrophilic uh, polymers, and we're able to uh, safely uh, inject these polymer prodrugs uh, subcutaneously uh, to the mice. And we observed that this uh, initiation route was safe because there was no local toxicity at the uh, injection site. So it means that we were able to uh, switch from high V administration to subcutaneous administration, uh, even with uh, uh, highly vesicant uh, anti cancer drugs. And from the new experiments, at the same dose, we were able to attain the same uh, anti cancer activity than Paxol uh, that was injected intravenously. And because in our case, we could increase the MTD of Pachytaxel because of this linkage between the Pachytaxel and the polymer, we were able to increase the concentration of the treatments and then that way we were able to outperform uh, the activity of, of Taxol. So we are able to uh, safely uh, switch from IV administration of Pachytaxel to subcutaneous administration of Pachytaxel through this uh, product approach. And uh, thanks to this discovery, we founded a sub company called Imesha with some colleagues. Uh, and the idea is to push forward uh, this technology uh, close to uh, clinical trials. So the last um, result I would like to highlight is uh, the synthesis of heterotelicatic polymer prodrugs. So up to now, the structure we obtained was this one, one drug attached at the extremity of a small polymer chain. So since we use nitroxide as a controlling agent, most of the polymer chains uh, that are obtained at the end of polymerization comprise this, uh, this nitroxide moiety. So the idea was to try to see whether it would uh, it could be able it would be able uh, to functionalize the other extremity of the polymer chain by applying what is called a nitroxide change reaction, uh, and the idea was to replace the H1 nitroxide with another nitroxide, but this one functionalized with the molecule of interest, either another drug or a frequent probe or targeting ligands to obtain this 1-1 uh, molar ratio heterotelicalic uh, polymer prodrugs. And after, the idea was to formulate those uh, prodrugs into the particles in the same way. So the method we, uh, we applied was really efficient, really robust, is quantitative because the driving force is the obtention of a much more stable bond between the polymer and the tempo nitroxide. And this method is really versatile because we can uh, adapt the chemistry to a lot of different molecules and, uh, uh, as I will highlight in, in a few minutes. So the first application area we envisioned was combination therapy because the idea was to put another molecule of interest, another drug, to uh, perform some combination therapy. The first combination we uh, we, uh, we, um, we prepare um, was uh, previously reported by Maya Jesus Vicente. Uh, it was AGM doxorubicin. She applied it to her uh, polymers to prepare polymer prodrugs, and we applied it to uh, our uh, um, drug initiated method. So we put AGM uh, on one chain end, and thanks to this nitroxide change reaction, we put doxorubicin at the other chain end of the polymer. We also apply it to other combinations, for instance, gemstabine lapatinib or gemstabine doxorubicin. So chemistry is working really uh, efficiently, it's really robust. 
we uh, obtain in all cases a one one more ratio between two drugs, between the, the two drugs. And then we perform some uh, cytotoxicity experiment to see whether um, we obtain the same kind of, of results uh, from MTT assays. Um, so what we discovered from this combination, the AG and doxorubicin, is that uh, all etiolytherotic prodrugs were more efficient than any kind of other combination. For instance, uh, monofunctional polymer prodrugs, also the counter precipitation between the two monofunctional polymer prodrugs into nanoparticles. However, uh, we don't obtain uh, those results for the other combinations. Uh, it, it was much more a case-by-case case study because, for instance, with the James Amin Lapatinim, we, uh, the coronal precipitation was more efficient than the heterotelic prodrugs. And in the case of the James Amin doxorubicin, the physical mixture of the two kinds of nanoparticles obtained from the monofunctional prodrugs were more efficient and the heterotelic were uh, the, the less efficient. The, the last uh, application we envision to an end of your presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last slide. So the last application we envision was imaging. Uh, so if you put doxorubicin, for instance, you have uh, an already fluorescent polymer prodrugs that can be fooled by cofagon microscopy. But if you don't work with fluorescent probes, uh, fluorescent drugs, you can uh, uh, link fluorescent probes to the polymer, for instance, rhodamine, and you can also observe them by cofagon microscopy. And if you want to perform uh, animal imaging then you just have to link some infrared emitting dyes to your promote projects. Okay, so as conclusion, uh, I'd like to, to highlight the fact that this method is believed to be quite uh, robust, and I would say quite universal, and we try to, to, uh, to push it forward, especially uh, the subcutaneous approach, but we're also now trying to, to see whether we could implement some stimuli responsiveness to those projects to create some more advanced uh, nanomaterials. So I'd like to finish by thank you uh, all again for your attention and thanking uh, all the, the person, especially the students and the postdoc working with, with me uh, on these uh, uh, topics. And thanks a lot again for your kind attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, other questions? Maybe I should say two things. Wait, we have time for a short question. And I just negotiated with uh, administration behind us. It is that we can go to chat room number two afterwards. So after all the presentations are done, we could meet briefly in the chat room and discuss other things. So I'm just trying to find out what questions we have. Maybe while, while Rudolf is uh, searching for the questions, I will ask one. Uh, no, I see no. <laughs> okay, that, that the stage is anyhow mine. Um, Julia, I was just very surprised when I saw a lot of your structures, they are extremely hydrophobic, but you don't seem to have any solubility issues. So how do you avoid aggregation of these polymers? You mean aggregation when you make particles or yeah. after administration? Yeah, when you have made the particles, because you told us that the particles are solvent free, so you don't have any, uh, sorry, surfactant free, so you don't have surfactant on it exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And this is quite, it was very surprising because um, the, the really first results reported in, in this field, the fact that you grew polymer from drugs were reported by, by Chen and they grew polylactide from a uh, packet cell, for instance. And they had to use uh, some pruronic, for instance, to stabilize their particles. But what we discovered basically with our polymers is that the zeta potential of our nanoparticles uh, was extremely uh, negative, like minus 60 millivolts, minus 70 millivolts. So I think it has something to do with the, some kind of, I would say, I'm not an expert, but some kind of arrangement of the counter ions on the surface of the particles that are really close to the surface and stabilize the, the wall nanoparticles. And, and, and yeah, we were paying, we, we noticed that with uh, many different polymers, either polyisoprene or polyscromitacolate, and even if we change the nature of the drugs. So this is something quite, I would say, specific perhaps to, to vinyl, more, uh, vinyl polymers, maybe. So you could effectively exclude any kind of, let's say, hydrolysis of the ester, which would lead yeah, to... Yeah, we, 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 we thought about it initially. We, we say, okay, maybe some, part of, some drugs may yeah. have been cleaved from the polymer, but we took some NMR at different times, and, and it was rough, exactly the same, I would say. So uh, I think we can exclude this, yeah. Okay, then. Thank, thank you very much you, from my side for the great talk. We have to, thanks for quite yeah. some questions. Now, can we come back to the regular session? And now the, the next presentation will be from Rainer Haag.
Thank you, Rudolf. Yeah. For and I think your... some words about you. You are a well-known professor from Berlin, and uh, you mentioned as topics. I think you are. I know have a lot to do with uh, dendritic polymers in all kinds of applications for material science to bio and as proteinosis material, drug delivery, and so on and so on. And we are very much interested in your presentation. Please go on. Thank you, Rudolf, for inviting me and also for giving me the opportunity here to present our results. And I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure, of course, we are working with molecular trees a lot, as you already mentioned. We are also working a lot with multivalency. And this is basically the decoration of those trees with functionalities that can target. And we have discovered uh, a few years back a very simple way of targeting leukocytes uh, in inflammation. And this is basically by taking uh, polyglycerols or dendritic polyglycerols and simply putting sulfate groups on. And this allows us to target the surface of leukocytes, but also to target inflammation very specifically by a simple two-step approach, because one step is to make the polymer, the second step is to do the sulfation. And if we put, for example, fluorescent labels on them, we can basically see that we can get very nice um, uh, amplification of the sites of inflammation. For example, if you have an acute ear inflammation model, then only the ears will light up. If you have a rheumatic arthritis model, then only the inflamed joints will light up. And this way we thought might be applicable also to tumor therapy because this is also always associated with inflammation. Now, in order to do so, and most drugs um, of um, tumor therapy are very hydrophobic, we decided to go for a micellar approach as already shown in the two previous talks. And we, I will introduce two concepts that we developed. One is a block copolymer micelle that I will show first, and then I will t t bring this down to a single molecule where we have a hydrophobic core and a polysulfated shell. And uh, the, pre uh, the first concept was introduced by Yinan Chong and Michael Schirner, and they uh, produced a concept that allowed us to take this polysulfated dendritic polyglycerol, connect it to a polycaprolactone chain as a hydrophobic block. And this is done via a disulfide linker that allows us to use the reductive environment in the tumor to release the encapsulated doxorubicin that was in, uh, released basically, uh, will be released at the high glutathione level inside the cell. Now, to show that release can also be done in vitro, we have of course done a lot of in vitro studies and we could show that under reductive conditions there is significantly more release than under normal buffered conditions. And this allows us to then go also in vivo and before we do so I will show you just a few uh, examples how we can encapsulate the drug and this is a very simple protocol too. So once we have our micelles and you can see here a cryoelectronic uh, electron micrograph again we take the compound and add uh, in solution, uh, add the drug, and we simply stir it. And by stirring it, you get basically get the drug solubilized. And what we then do is a size exclusion column to separate the encapsulated drug carrier complex. Um, and that will give us a very pure uh, system to then do uh, in vivo studies and so on. So, to encapsulate, once encapsulated this uh, hydrophobic cyanine dye that allowed us to compare two systems, one without the sulfate groups, this is shown here in the upper case, and one with the sulfate group on that is shown here in the lower case. Now, what is interesting that of course, with the xenograph tumor, we get also some targeting in the case of the system without, probably by EPR, but there's a significantly higher targeting effect even after seven days once we have the sulfate groups on. And this clearly shows that you can have a big benefit of the sulfate groups. In addition, we could detect early metastasis 
And this is not possible with the uncharged, not, not multivalent system where you just have the polymer backbone. We then went uh, one step further to look at the comparison of the uh, in vitro and in vivo results. In vitro, one can say that the system is almost as active as the free drug in, in cellular systems. And the big advantage is that we have no body weight loss when we go in, in vivo uh, in comparison to the free drugs. Doxorubicin at a high uh, level um, causes problems to the animals as it is known. The biggest surprise was when we looked at long-term survivals, then the uh, glutathione cleavable system had the best survival rate and we, after about 80 days, we didn't find a single dead animal. And this is basically quite impressive. In all the control groups, the animals died after a few days. Now, let me switch to a second concept based on the simple micellar approach I introduced already. We want to go to a single molecular micelle to make this system more robust and even more defined. And what we came up with is a polymerization approach that is a one-step approach to make this dendritic core where we co-polymerize glycerol and caprolactone and then to have an excess of glycerol on the surface that we can sulfate again. It's a one per step procedure, which we do now do on a 100 gram scale. And this is something that allows us to introduce not only different degrees of sulfation, but also different uh, zeta potentials on the surface that is basically different charge densities. Also, we can see that by enzymatic degradation using esterases, for example, then we can get degraded products that have uh, shifted molecular weights that are significantly smaller than the original molecule that indicates already that we also can release here. Now, in, in, in vitro studies, we looked at, uh, again, using doxorubicin as a control. We looked at uh, the cellular toxicity. Of course, um, doxorubicin has uh, somewhere at its toxicity starting on the level of one to three micromolar. And um, when we encapsulate in a non-sulfated carrier, there was not a strong um, toxicity in the cells at the same level. However, with the sulfated carriers, which are also cellularly uptaken, we see a significantly enhanced uptake and also comparing different molecular weights, a small one and a larger one, uh, there was a similar effect with uh, almost a level of factor of three to 10 higher than the native doxorubicin. So this was a good indication. For this reason, we went back also to in vivo studies. And in this case, we focused primarily on the distribution. Again, we encapsulated a dye that is hydrotropic and can be visualized. And again, it was possible with this unimolecular carrier system, simply having a core and the uh, sulfate groups on uh, where the dye is now encapsulated, we can visualize the specifically the tumor sites and have um, a, a very nice effect even after uh, a significant amount of time as compared to the um, non-targeted uh, uh, systems. And this is basically what we have seen uh, as, a con uh, as a conclusion is that we have now uh, a new way to, in a two-step approach at the moment, uh, overall we do 20 grams. Um, we are currently developing a GMP process and started a company on this um, to target uh, tumor sites with these multivalent polysulfated constructs that allow us, us to encapsulate different hydrophobic drugs in the carrier system with a very efficient targeting. Now, having said this, I would like to thank the people who did the work, I mean, uh, this is basically, I introduced some of them already, but Michael Schirner, my colleague, he started the company, the Campus Therapeutics, who will further try to find an application on this on the market. I have to thank myself also, especially the Collaborative Research Center, SFB765, who sponsored us for the last 12 years on this project, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice presentation and for keeping so well in time. Uh, I assume there are some questions. I also try to find the... No.
I see no questions in the moment, but say, um, maybe I can just put a question. So the thing is you just, uh, you target by charge, by negative charge and size. Yes. Mostly but, charge, yeah. The, there's a special effect of the sulfates. Sulfates have a, uh, an effect that binds to uh, polysulfates like heparin as well, yeah. Bind to scavenger receptors of cell, but besides that, it bind. They bind also to P and L selectin, uh, and P selectin especially is overexpressed on tumor cells, and that helps a lot for the targeting. Mm -hmm. But you vary the size. Now, I think size goes with EPR effect. And by varying the size, this is also something which makes accessibility. So you, yes. I assume so you are more in the range where the molecules are, the detrimental are small. So you have a good excess and then it comes more into the direction of molecular targeting, as a yes. active targeting. Yes. Okay. Thank so we don't purely use size. This is a side effect. We see some EPR targeting but we mostly target by charge. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So then uh, we go on for the next presentation. And the next, thank you very much. And the next presentation will be from Mainz. Maybe he's sitting close to me, <laughs> which is Paul Bazenius. And Paul Bazenius is a person who combines also organic chemistry and macromolecular chemistry, and he combines it especially with supramolecular chemistry. And he's now spent some years in Mainz. He got a, a grant from the European Community. And Paul, where are you? Okay. It would be great if you can give your presentation. Very good. I share my screen. I hope this is working. Yes. Very good. Yeah, now it's really in presentation mode. Good. And you can see my pointer as well. There's something moving along the screen. You can... Not yet, Paul, but I think... This is not... I also do not see it. Oh, let me just... Okay. So maybe I'll start talking while... <laughs> So thanks, Rudolf, for the introduction. It's great to be part of, let me just, ah, desktop, there it is. This is what I want. It's great to be part of this uh, session with so many um, speakers that some of know, some I know very well, some I don't know at all. So it's great to be part of the session. Let me just try again to share the screen. Is it working now? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So as, as uh, Professor Zentel mentioned, uh, the, the small story that I wanted to share uh, today is really based on what we can bring in um, to this arena or exciting arena of immune therapy using a supramacular approach. So for most of the structures that I'll be showing today, these will be supramacular polymers rather than covalent polymers, because in our case, the backbone, what holds those materials together are weak non-covalent interactions and we use as building blocks, in this case, those multi-domain peptides that I will explain in more detail in a couple of slides. But before I start, I should really acknowledge those that did the work. Uh, this, this whole work was started by a brilliant student, David Strasburger, in the, on, from the synthetic side in chemistry and in, on the immunology side of things, the evaluation was done by Natasha Stergiu. And that work was now carried or taken over by Moritz and Riem uh, and many others, I should, uh, I should say. For those who are interested, uh, both uh, uh, prepared a poster, poster 51, I learned this morning, for those who are interested. So for the, the small story today, I would really like to focus, for the vaccines we are making, I would really like to focus on the mucin type vaccine, particular mucin 1, because these are structures that are fairly well known actually. Those mucins are part of the vital uh, epithelium in many uh, healthy tissues, especially soft tissues in lungs and female tissues. So they are relevant for breast cancer, for example. They're a very important part of the glycocalyx. As I said, the, the peptide backbone, the sequence 
is known. And if you look a little bit more in detail, you have a couple of amino acids that are glycosylated. And in the case of healthy tissue, these are heavily glycosylated. So huge glycan side chains that make up this glycocalyx. The, the, the situation changes drastically if you go to tumorous tissue, because here the glycosyl transferase activity, for example, is reduced. So that means that the glycan side chains just become, they become shorter, they become chopped up. Uh, and what is also known is that the silase uh, um, activity goes up, so they become end capped, so to say. I use polymer language now, they become end capped with neuronomic uh, acid. In this case, it's also shown here. Um, I can't, sh yeah, I hope I'm showing at the right thing because in, on my screen, Rainer Haag's face is now on top of the silic acid, but I, I guess you can see it here. Um, so it, it would be amazing if you can use those structures that are now exposed to the immune system. If you can use those or actually make those structures and train the immune system using uh, vaccines. And of course, this is a short presentation that I'm giving today, but nevertheless, I, I, I really would like to give credit to the pioneers in the field. Um, one of them is Horst Kunz in Mainz, who has made a vaccines, a tumor associated mucin one vaccines over the last decades and what he uses an approach I would now call the, the pharmaceutical approach to so the glycoconjugate approach whereby you take these glycopeptides that I've just sh shared with you and you those are actually I should point out are not very immunogenic so you need to attach them onto a, a protein carrier that, that uh, stimulates the immune system in this case tetanus toxoid um, this is one option the other option is to go fully synthetic, so the fully molecular approach uh, work, for example, by Hechtian Bones, where you uh, take the mucin ones connected as B-cell epitope connected to the T-helper cell epitope in blue, as well as a TLR2 ligand uh, in this case, so fully molecular synthetic approach. Uh, let me just point out that, uh, to highlight this again, what the pharmaceutical industry does for that very important class of uh, glycoconjugate uh, vaccines, particularly in the area of um, infectious diseases, what I'm just showing you here is one example, um, a, a vaccine against a bug called Haemophilus influenza type B, so hip vaccine, where you do exactly this, the, the oligosaccharide pathogen specific marker is connected covalently onto your protein, T cell epitope, um, tetanus toxoid protein in this case. And what we decided to do was remove the covalent linkage here, remove this, and put in a super molecular linkage because that gives you uh, flexibility, modularity um, in making molecules, attaching all the functionality that you need, uh, B cell epitopes, T cell epitopes that are absolutely, that are absolutely crucial. But as I will share with you um, in two slides, you can go for more functionality that is very helpful um, when you try to uh, modulate the immune uh, response. And this is what we now call, we call it a modular super molecular subunit toolbox. And the, the supramolecular chemistry comes in because you can mix at will with all the different functionality that you need, as I'm showing you on the, the bottom right here. Uh, so this, is, this was our core business up until a few years ago. On the right hand side, you can see what those supramolecular polymers can look like. So in this case, these are peptidic materials that self-assembly mortar to make these in what you see with electron microscopy, these filaments, the beta sheet rich filaments based on fully synthetic molecules. And they are, in terms of morphology, they are not too different compared to what nature does as part of the um, cytoskeleton. Uh, uh, cytoskeleton is full of supramolecular polymers, except for the fact that these are, in terms of backbone, these are then uh, proteins, obviously. Uh, synthesis, I will not show too much synthesis. I'd just like to point out that using solid phase peptide synthesis, we have access to all the peptides and glycopeptides um, some building blocks you can buy, some you need to make over several synthetic steps to make those glycosylated amino acids. These via, via the uh, copper azide click chemistry we attach onto our, I guess to use Reiner's language, this is also something like a molecular tree. It's much smaller than Reiner's trees. This is a dendritic amphiphile. I mean, it's solubilized via these tetraethylene glycols. In the core, you now have uh, very hydrophobic amino acids that are prone to self-assembly in water. They will form uh, better sheet-rich structures. Hydrogen bonding as well as desolvation are extremely important. 
And then you attach in the final step, uh, click chemistry orthogonal, you attach the glycopeptide onto that monomer. You attach further functionality by using in blue now the T cell epitope, um, uh, which will act as a stimulant in a way, a T helper cell epitope is very important. Uh, this is the immunogenic sequence from tetanus toxoid, also known as P30. And what turned out to be also very important is the third functionality that we dialed in is this TLR7-8 agonist um, in order to stimulate the innate immune system. It had embedded so quinoline derivative that is also attached covalently onto the third monomer. Then you take a structural monomer, so fourth component to make everything soluble. You mix and then you apply those as vaccines. Typically for us, uh, the protocol looks as follows. You uh, first vaccination, three booster vaccinations, and then after 47 days, you look at the uh, antibody titers that are produced. What we observe is a weak IgM response, which is great. The IgG response is strong. In the case of the TLR7-8 agonist, it's Th1 mediated. Um, and this is something I, I would like to sh or highlight. If you look at the IgG2b and IgG2c levels, what you see with the, uh, this orange arrow, I hope you can all see this, on the right, this orange arrow, the, the immune uh, response or the antibody response shoots up uh, due to that TLR7-8 ligand. So for, that, for us, this is great news because it means that the molecular information that we, that we dial in, that we put into our multifunctional uh, polymers um, is translated, if I can use that word, is translated into in the immune response. Um, so this is information from the vaccination that I wanted to share with you. Uh, the, the other thing I just quickly, I mean, this is just a short um, glimpse at some of the things that you can also do with the antibodies that are produced. This is now published data from uh, Edgar Schmidt's um, lab that we only contributed a little bit to. to. Uh, this data was, or the antibodies were produced using the traditional approach, so using a tetanus toxoid conjugate. Um, the, what I wanted to say is that the, mo the monoclonal antibodies are very selective. They will recognize uh, breast cancer tissue and breast cancer tissue only, human breast cancer tissue. And uh, again, looking at um, uh, tissues from breast cancer patients, the interesting thing is also that you see um, a strong correlation between uh, metastasis-free survival as well as the relapse-free survival uh, for those breast cancer patients that correlates with the density or the expression of tumor-associated mucin ones. And this is made accessible via these monoclonal antibodies. I also wanted, to, and it is just the last slide to close the scientific part, what I also wanted to show is the preventive vaccination that is now Possible. Again, this is published data, not with the supramolecular uh, vaccines, but using the tetanus toxoid conjugates, using as a, as a, uh, a transgenic mouse uh, model, uh, a, um, a cross between a mouse model that develops a memory gland tumor spontaneously with a mouse that expresses uh, human mucin 1 in the epithelium. And that is also uh, super interesting because what you then see is that you get a reduction in tumor growth only if you use that cross between the, the, tum the, the, um, the spontaneous model with the human mucin ones in the case those mice are immunized. Just a short glimpse at some of the, that data um, that was obtained, again, using what I called earlier the pharmaceutical approach where the uh, the mucin-1 glycopeptide B-cell epitope was now connected to tetanus toxide via covalent approach. So no supramolecular polymer in this case yet, I should say. Um, so with that, I would like to close. I hope I could give you an, uh, a short insight in how we want to take supramolecular chemistry into this really exciting area of uh, immune therapy and vaccines in particular. I made sure that all of the co-workers as well as collaborators are acknowledged on the slides. And with that, I can close. I hope I'm in time. Um, and with that, I give back to Rudolf. Thank you. Oh. Oh, thank you very much for this nice presentation. So, other questions? Hmm. <laughs> okay. 
I have one, uh, Rudolf, if yeah, I may. Please. Yeah. So, Paul, when you apply these supramolecular concepts for linking to the toxin, uh, tetanus toxin, the, the question is, how stable is this under high dilution conditions? Um, yeah, this is a... <clears throat> As supramolecular chemists, we think we think too um, too clean. So we we think about aqueous systems and l make sure that the systems are stable enough. Um, to answer your question directly, we see a clear co correlation with um, stability and water solubility. Just to make it so, if you charge up your material or if you make it too hydrophilic, the critical aggregation concentration is high. But the trick is really in the detail because for those vaccines, we need the pore effects. So what we did naively at the beginning was just to uh, use injections or to apply the, the polymers by themselves, naked, so to say. But then the immune response is very weak. Um, if you, maybe I showed it the slides. Yeah. So the devil is in the detail because we apply them in an oil emulsion. So you're using this incomplete Freud adjuvant. So it's an oil emulsion, which then uh, leads to this depot effect. So the immune cells are recruited and start to eat away at the material. If this is diluted too quickly, then the immune response is weak. Now, obviously we try to circumvent these emulsions because using amphiphiles and emulsions is not a good combination because the, uh, it reduces the stability uh, because of surface tension. So we have others, uh, other ideas how to apply the vaccines without using, uh, without making it too complicated. Yeah. It's too early to share this. It's too okay. early to share this. But we know that if you're looking at the time delay here, I mean, it weeks, so the material seems to sit at this interface, uh, which is perfect for the vaccines. And again, this is, applied, this is applied intraperitonal. The same thing you can do as subcutaneous. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no other urgent questions in the moment. I think we should go on and maybe chat a bit afterwards. And the next presentation will be from Matthias Bartz. I think Matthias Bartz is known for us uh, as a researcher for Mainz. He was there in Mainz for a long time as an independent research group leader, but now he got a full chair at the University of Leiden in pharmacy. And Matthias, please, go on. I cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, I was extremely stupid. I started my presentation without unmuting and then realizing that it's difficult to return. So first of all, um, Thank you very much, Rudolf, for the kind introduction. Thank you all for sharing this online presentation and, of course, signing up for our session. I think that's the most important thing to say. Uh, then second, I feel a little bit sorry. We have seen some really delicate organic chemistry from uh, Paul before, and now we'll switch gears. And uh, for people knowing me, they also know that I really appreciate organic and uh, let's say a little bit more advanced polymer chemistry. But today I will definitely switch gears and show you how you can use relatively simple systems to um, develop novel approaches or basically make existing drugs better in terms of tuberculosis therapy. So I guess most of you have heard about tuberculosis, that it's an airborne infectious bacteria, which uh, easily infects the lung and resides inside granuloma. So it can remain very inactive for a long time and doesn't co cause severe systems, which is vice versa also an issue because you don't realize that you are affected, infected. So when it turns to the active phase, you may end up with severe, potential even deadly symptoms. And uh, worldwide, we have uh, millions of cases and 1.5 million deaths related to tuberculosis in 2018, and numbers are increasing over the last couple of years. So in this respect, we need to say that accessibility is really an issue, and getting a small drug to the target seems already very complex. 
The standard therapy is a combination of uh, four first-line antibiotics. And you can see here very nicely that uh, usually um, the standard therapy takes already a while and you have uh, treatment durations of six months. If it comes to um, multidrug resistant bacteria, you easily can end up with 20 months or even longer treatment regimes, which means that individual patients have to swallow easily five to 10,000 pills. And you can imagine in third world countries that will never work. In the long term, this means you generate more and more um, multidrug resistant TB strains. Um, there is some hope, some new drugs are approved, for example, Pretomanit, that's what I'm showing here on the slides. And you will see later on, this is, sometime, this is used by us as an internal control when we want to know how efficient our therapies really are. Of course, this is not possible for me as an organic chemist to do it on my own. So we really depend on great collaboration partners, either the group of Gareth Griffiths in Oslo, uh, Andrew Thompson, who is uh, contributing the drugs, and Ole Scheible in Basel, who is providing the mice models. Because you can imagine tuberculosis is uh, a deadly disease, so even the, the mice models are quite complicated to handle. Uh, actually, in, we could already demonstrate that for certain nanoparticles, we have very nice accumulation patterns uh, in zebra fish lavea, as well as in mice. Yeah. When I have Rainer Haag here, he was also involved in this study and also could show that the poly trees can also perform well when it comes to accumulation in tuberculosis infected areas inside the lung. Interestingly, this is possible after IV injection. While most people have always worked with inhalation um, or intranasal application routes, um, our partners found out that intravenous injection can be also a way. And of course, this brings us a little bit closer to the dream that we can basically cure TB with one, two, three, four single injections instead of taking pills over a long period of time. So before I talk about the systems we have developed, I would briefly explain once again what uh, the polymers we are using are all about. We exclusively work with polypeptoids with the O in brackets, and these are usually block copolymers combining um, a polysarcosine with a polypeptide unit. Well, the polysarcosine provides PEC-like properties, which are water solubility, somehow same flexibility in solution, plus the well-known protein resistance. And I think some of you have heard before that uh, the talk of BioNTech, where they use this technology and basically to substitute pegylated lipids in their LNP formulation and found out in uh, preclinical models that the, these systems are way better tolerated than the PEG-based analogos. So next, second take home message is that you basically can make very clean polymers. So of course, by training, I'm a polymer chemist and I'm always very happy if I see um, yeah, Poisson-like molecular weight distributions even for blocker polymers. So take home message is you can make very defined structures um, completely based on endogenous material, which basically bring in all the desired property for drug delivery systems. And maybe last but not least, there is a company in Valencia, which also has established um, the GMP facility to produce these materials in GMP grade to enable pharmaceutical companies to push this into clinical studies. Having said that, I would like to return to the project here and um, the drugs we were mostly interested in, this holds true for Prechominit and also for the drugs developed by Andrew Thompson, um, they always have very limited solubility. So they are very effective, but they generally lack bioavailability. Of course, Prechominit is given orally and therefore the resorption um, over the gut is different but it always limits levels in blood. So therefore coming up with formulations is a great idea. Usually we like to make core cross-linked micelles, but here in this approach, we realize that most of these drugs have uh, electron deficient um, aromatic groups. 
And this brought us back to the old work of Wim Hennig, where he basically uh, tried to convince me of better. Tuan Lammers tried to convince me that this is a great approach. I never really believed in that until we used this technology, encapsulated the drug, um, basically took profit of these pi-pi interactions between this uh, benzyl protective groups, which are electron rich and the electron deficient um, drugs used here. And much to our surprise, it didn't really matter what uh, drug we used. Of course, they are all similar, similar to each other's, but we always ended up with nanoparticles um, around uh, 100 nanometers in diameter. But as you can see on the cryogenic TEM, uh, upon drug loading, we see a morphology switch so that we don't only have spherical, but also slightly elongated worm-like micelles. Um, of course, the next step is to apply these formulations. But, you know, I was talking a lot about stability. And frankly speaking, I never really believed that these systems are stable. And there's a very nice methodology we have established in Mainz at the Max Planck uh, Institute for Polymer Research in the group of Kaloyan and Koinov, and that's fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, or in our case, fluorescence cross-correlation spectroscopy. And it's a very nice tool to assess stability of my cells or any kind of polymeric system in aqueous solution, but also in protein rich solution or even blood. And uh, basically, you check for the cross correlation. Basically, you prepare my cells having two individual dyes. And uh, when you bring them together and there is dynamic visible dynamics present, there is an exchange between different unimers uh, within the my cell, and you will ultimately we come up with my cells having both dyes and you nicely see cross correlation, which means when we see cross correlation, there's dynamics and very likely the systems are not stable. And then much to our surprise, we basically never ever saw cross correlation. We didn't see it in aqueous solution. We didn't see it in buffer. We didn't see it in human blood plasma. Um, but we also did not see that in uh, pulmonary surfactant, so basically lung surfactant, because we were also envisioning um, intranasal or aerosol delivery, and therefore we just checked that. So basically, these pi pi stabilized micelles are surprisingly stable, and way more stable than I imagined. And of course, this uh, brought us together with the fact that we can load them very nicely, very easily. Um, to move into animal models. And the first model is the Zebra Fischlavea. And there, basically, you can come up with two models established in the group of Gareth Griffiths. So one is the blood infection model, where you basically inject the bacteria in this Myobacterium marinum, which is the natural um, bacterium, natural host, is the Zebra Fischlavea. You inject that and wait for the distribution. Or you go for neural tube infection, where you have granuloma formation, which is somehow a little bit more uh, related to the real world situation. And then we use this as first as a toxicity uh, in toxicity studies to check um, how our polymers are tolerated. And you see nicely that basically all these uh, anti TB drugs we have applied, they are extremely toxic to the zebra fish. And within these formulations, you can alter that a little. So you can again reduce toxicity, which is quite common. And you see already that there is the famous drug D. And uh, this drug is quite important. It has no name yet, but it's uh, analogous to pretomanid. And it's turned out to be the most effective one. In the blood infection model, we could basically, for the first time in this lab, show that basically all bacteria are irradiated um, from the fish. And um, this is, of course, quite nice starting point, but of course, it's also the easiest model. So we went to a head-to-head -head comparison study with Pretomanid, which was also in this case encapsulated in our micelles. And we could nicely show that the fish efficacy of this drug D, um, which has basically not even oral um, bioavailability, is very high also in this uh, neural tube infection model. So we can basically, with a very simple technology, enhance the bioavailability of the drug and therefore achieve, yeah, really a cure of the infection in zebra fish. But of course, zebra fish, it's obvious, it's a very simple model. Um, so therefore, the next step, of course, is to go to mice as the more relevant model. 
And there are basically, um, it's always a standard procedure. The mice are infected with the tuberculosis bacterium, um, which of course requires extremely complicated experimental setups, which are done in the group in Borstel. And um, Ulrich Scheibel is doing an, an amazing job. But the question for us was, do we want to go further IV? Do we want to go intranasal or aerosol-wise um, into the lung where most of these uh, bacteria resides? And we had to learn that intranasal, that's maybe the only uh, spoiler in the beginning, is not working at all. We don't know why, but we never ever made it deep down in the lung and we never made coloc uh, reached colocalization with um, the bacteria inside the lung. But what was really surprising to us that in this quite complicated cram and quite difficult to treat Kramnik mouse model of tuberculosis, we could again show that um, with the formulation of uh, drug D, um, we can achieve quite um, efficient therapeutic effects either in the lung, which is the pri primarily primary uh, side where the bacteria is residing, but also in the spleen where you from time to time have a transfer. But most importantly, what you can also see here, we can significantly increase the drug dose without causing any toxic effect to the tissue. And of course, that's usually the most promising thing. If you can give three times more drug, it's very likely that you will have way better effects even moving forward into the clinical translation. With that, I hope I could show you that sometimes even very simple uh, pi stabilized micelles um, can be very effective in terms of uh, drug loading and stability in various body fluids that they are, can be reused in this preclinical um, uh, model of uh, the zebra fish lavea to uh, irradiate bacteria, And then further, when you move into more complex models that they provide um, therapeutic efficiency and uh, reduce tissue inflammation because they are just um, better tolerated compared to other formulations or other systems. And with that, I want to thank once again the, the amazing group of scientists working with us in uh, tuberculosis research. And we really hope that um, in the future we can use our systems to uh, develop novel therapies uh, for these life-threatening disease. And of course, I have to thank also the chemists in my group doing all this work and the funding agencies and all the collaboration partners worldwide. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to take questions. Matthias, thanks you very much for this nice presentation. Seeing here, no, I don't see immediate questions, yeah. but Good of let's say, There's no one uh, yeah. Paul is breathing again, so we should give him the word. Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Matthias. There was lots of new stuff that I didn't know. So the Pi Pi, I mean, it's an obvious one for me, right? So, yeah. yeah. So what is, um, uh, what is your evidence for Pi Pi? Uh, do you have ordered cores? That's the question. Do you have uh, order in your course? That's a very good question. Um, we have seen so far very, very few indications for orders, ordered cores. Actually, I never believed in that. The funny thing is what I can say, that's why it, we believe in these pi pi interactions. If I take away the benzyl group and substitute it by an aliphatic uh, group, the systems are not stable. Even the, the drug formulations, they aggregate in, in serum, which is something um, which shows already that uh, yeah, when the, you, these systems must be extremely efficient in stabilizing the drug and coming generating a quite stable nanoparticle, way more stable than I ever believed. As frankly, I never believed in that. But you are certainly right. The pi pi interaction is an assumption. It sounds cool. So, I don't uh, Matthias, say yeah. As one, do you have an idea why? Um, what's behind for effectiveness of a system? One is, I would say that if you increase bioavailability, this should always be good. If you reduce toxicity, it's also good because you can give more material. But is there a chance that the, with tuberculosis bacteria, we all we often live in some types of endosomes or something in vesicles within the cell? 
Do you, is there any evidence that maybe you reach them better because your nanoparticles are taken up by endocytosis and they may fuse with some, uh, yeah. It sounds good, but I don't believe in that. As I think the, the reason is very simple, say, when you have latent phases of the inflammation, which is the case in these models we have been using, um, you have something like EPR based behavior and the particles are stable. I didn't show the data. They have quite elongated circulation times in zebra fish. And we saw when you have elongated circulation times, you have passive accumulation in this granuloma. That was the initial work. So we have roughly, even in mice, around 10% injected dose um, at the infected area. So this can be a contribution that uh, we get the drug more specifically in infected areas. I would not make the claim that we come into the same endosomal compartment. Of course, we are trying that, but uh, at least we have not yet seen beneficial effects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, then I think we should go on. And Matthias, do you want to go on with sharing the session? Yeah, let me unshare first. Perfect, yeah. So then it's my great pleasure um, to basically take over um, the, yeah, the chair of Rudolf Zentl. And um, then we will come to the next talk of the session. And it's my absolute great pleasure to introduce Horacio Cabral. Um, I'm quite sure he will uh, tell us uh, very exciting stories about the use of polymeric micelles in cancer therapy. So therefore, Horacio, first of all, you have my greatest respect. Thanks, How Matthias. What's the time in Tokyo right now? Uh, it's 11.44. <laughs> so if, if I rush to finish, I can catch the last train. <laughs> I, I'll stay for the discussion. So okay, so I, right. I think I will, I will sleep in the lab today. Yeah, that was that's what I was really anticipating. Yeah, so please, the stage is yours. We are looking forward to your lecture. Well, thank you very much, Matthias and, and Rudolf, for the kind invitation. Um, I'm very happy to see old friends' faces and uh, see that the situation with the COVID has not been harmful for uh, for anybody. So I'm going to explain uh, our recent progress on polymeric devices for cancer therapy. So maybe uh, most of you are familiar with our uh, research on uh, using polymeric micelles for the delivery of uh, different kinds of biomolecules and uh, therapeutic agents uh, to tumor tissues. So um, we have, uh, by using this technology, we have recently uh, progressed into different clinical trials. Some have uh, been uh, uh, down due to uh, not uh, proper efficacy. Others have been uh, shut down because uh, uh, the rise of uh, immunotherapy. So to catch up with the new trend in uh, treatment of cancer, uh, most of these uh, clinical trials have now been used with combination of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors for the treatment of uh, solid tumors. So in this case, we will uh, now uh, be studying um, micelles loading cisplatin or micelles loading epirubicin for the treatment of uh, head and neck cancer and soft tissue car sarcoma, uh, respectively. So the first one, the cisplatin micelle, is being used in combination with uh, Keytruda for uh, exerting uh, synergistic effects in these uh, uh, patients. Uh, the other one is looking for indications uh, for combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors, and this will benefit from the synergistic effect of uh, immunogenic cell death uh, rise by the epirubicin loaded uh, to the core of the micelles. So these micelles still target tumors by the uh, controversial uh, EPR effect. Uh, so there are uh, many, much evidence that EPR effect it's present in, in clinical tumors. However, recent information is telling us that the EPR effect is widely heterogeneous with high variability between patients and 
also between different relations within within the same patient. So we we know we can we have to do better for targeting our drugs to, to tumors. So in our group, we have uh, identified several phenomena that can promote uh, tumor delivery. So we can adjust the physical chemical features of uh, the micelles to promote penetration into poorly permeable tumors, for example, changing the size of the charge of the uh, micelles. We can also promote the penetration by taking advantage of the dynamics of the vasculature uh, by using gradients in pressure to extravasate by uh, vascular burst. But uh, if you know these accumulations mediated by EPR effect are not even close to what we can achieve by using ligands for targeting the tumors. So here is a ligand mediated system that allows extravasation from the blood compartment into the tumor position. We can see very fast and selective accumulation into tumors. So we are now moving into a more ligand mediated targeting of uh, tumor tissues to promote uh, higher uh, efficiency in the delivery and higher efficacy of the treatments. So by using ligands, we can target different parts of the tumors. We can target the lining of the vasculature to promote extravasation, but also we can target the cells for promoting intracellular delivery. So in the clinic, a system that can do this uh, uh, very efficiently are uh, antibody drug conjugates. So we have uh, two ligands, the heavy, the, the light chains of the antibodies, and uh, in the heavy chains, the researchers usually conjugate uh, very potent payloads uh, to to kill the cancer cells. So because of the low low loading capacity of the antibodies, uh, researchers are restricted to use uh, super toxic drugs like that are one thousand uh, fold more toxic than regular chemotherapeutics. And because these drugs cannot be used as free drugs, and they are very toxic if they accumulate in the healthy tissues, they are linked by uh, very stable bonds so that they avoid off-targeting release. So while we can put antibodies on our micelles, we know that the size will be significantly changed. So what we should do is uh, engineer uh, antibody fragments to modify our polymeric uh, micelle structures. So particularly we are interested on Fab prime uh, units that have a tire group for modification and installation of our particles. So we look into a clinically approved uh, antibody drug conjugate, uh, Bretuximab uh, Bedotin. This is uh, developed by Seattle Genetics and it has been uh, very successful in the clinic. So this Antibody drug conjugates consist of a monomethylauristatin E, which is a drug that works in the picomolar range. It has a self immolative spacer and then a, a D peptide bond that is susceptible to catepsin B uh, cleavage. So, because of the high hydrophobicity of this drug and the low places for conjugation, this antibody drug conjugate can only load four uh, monomethylauristatin per, per antibody. So in my group, uh, now uh, uh, he already uh, finished his PhD, Dr. Takuya Miyazaki. Uh, he developed these uh, polymeric mices loading 160 monomethylauristatin E per particle, so we can increase the payload and uh, uh, take advantage of the targeting by antibodies. So in this mice design, we also keep the enzymatic cleavable structure so we can uh, promote uh, catepsin B selective uh, activation. So as a target uh, marker, we selected uh, Fn8-2 that is overexpressed in the vasculature of tumors, but also in cancer cells. And it is known that uh, if you aggregate the receptors, it will promote endocytosis and we can use it for intracellular delivery of our uh, micelles. So to conjugate the drug, uh, instead of using the common uh, Michael addition with a disulfide, we use a uh, Diels alder. So this gives us uh, the advantage of a uh, non cleavable bond. Uh, so instead of, of the retro Michael addition promoted by uh, using a tile group here, we can achieve a very stable conjugation to the polymer that will only be cleaved 
vicatepsin B after uh, entering the cancer cells. So to modify the particles, we introduce the fab primes by click chemistry, and we have a ligand uh, positioning uh, in the proper direction on the surface of the particle. The size is almost not changed after uh, ligand modification. So what we see first uh, uh, in the tumors uh, in vivo is that the ligands can promote the intratumoral delivery. So here we have a uh, mice without ligand, they can achieve a targeting by EPR effect, very slow extravasation. If we use the ligands targeting the vasculature, we can increase the selectivity and the uh, intratumoral uh, distribution. So we then analyze the tumors by ex vivo imaging and see that the accumulation by the ligands promoted a five-fold increase in the levels of uh, micelles in the tumors. And this increased accumulation and delivery promoted uh, the regression even just after one injection uh, of treatment. So the problem with antibodies is that uh, their targeting will be very limited to just one type of tumor. So instead we look to more uh, universal ligands that can promote cellular targeting and also vascular targeting. So in our case, uh, we decided to look into glucose as glucose is uh, a, a key for the uh, metabolism in tumors. So glucose transporter is highly overexpressed in tumor position. So we studied two types of tumors, OSC19 and U87MC. This is a head and neck cancer and this is a, a glioblastoma. And we found that uh, both the cancer cells and the uh, endothelial cells in the tumors present a GLUT1 transporter. So we can exploit this uh, distribution of GLUT1 uh, receptors for uh, at achieving enhanced extravasation and uh, intracellular delivery. So to test this concept, we use the clinically uh, studied uh, polymeric micelles with loading cisplatin and we installed uh, glucose at the carbon-6 that allow us to interact with the glucose-1 uh, transporter. Uh, and uh, we control the density of the ligand between 0 to 50 percent. So we check the accumulation of the micelles with glucose and micelles without glucose into tumors and we see that our hypothesis is correct. The micelles with glucose are uh, extravasating much faster than the the micelles without uh, uh, glucose on the surface. If we see the, the profile of penetration, we can clearly identify an active penetration profile and enhance delivery into tumor interstitial. So this uh, enhanced penetration and uh, uh, extravasation into the tumor leads to improve uh, accumulation into tumor, which is twofold higher compared to the EPR effect. This is the head and neck tumor that uh, I show you the histology. This is the brain tumor. We can also promote the delivery that is twofold higher the amount of uh, EPR effect. And uh, th this enhanced delivery translates into a higher anti-tumor efficacy. So it's worth noting that uh, this head and neck cancer uh, contains a uh, uh, more than 50% of cancer stem cells, so it's highly intractable. If you see here, uh, cisplatin or cisplatin micelles have no effect on the tumor growth rate. Only the micelles with 25% are able to suppress the growth rate. And um, in the case of the brain tumor, again, only the micelles with glucose achieve a significant anti-tumor efficacy. So besides using uh, natural ligands, we focus also on using um, chemical ligands, as Professor Hag uh, indicated, they can provide us a wide range of capabilities uh, and processability for generating uh, artificial uh, synthetic uh, ligand approaches. So the target that we selected is uh, sialic acid because it's highly overexpressed into, in, on tumor cells, so we can uh, make a ligand that will uh, take uh, uh, possibilities into uh, many tumor uh, targetings. The problem is that uh, sialic acid is also widely uh, present on endothelial cells or 
um, red blood cells uh, in the bloodstream. So if we inject a ligand to sialic acid, it will be immediately bound to uh, the sialic acid that is on, on the uh, bloodstream. So to overcome this uh, issue, we uh, selected uh, phenylboronic acid ligands. So phenylboronic acid ligands have uh, the benefit that uh, they can keep the binding affinity with sialic acid at uh, uh, intratumoral pH, but when they are in physiological pH 7.4, they uh, also present binding affinity to other type of uh, uh, sugars. So because the amount of sugar in the bloodstream is uh, 5 millimolar, uh, we can uh, prevent uh, the binding to sialic acid. But once we go into the tumor, the amount of glucose goes down because of the glycolysis rate of cancer cells and the amount of sialic acid increases. So we can achieve selective um, targeting to the cancer cells. So the problem with the traditional boronic acid is that phenylboronic acid is that the binding constant to sialic acid is quite low. So we have recently screened 100 uh, molecules uh, uh, containing uh, phenylboronic groups and found that uh, this 5-boronopicolinic acid has a very strong binding constant to sialic acid at uh, intratumoral pH. And uh, interesting for us, this uh, uh, selectivity to sialic acid is much higher than the other sugars and at pH 7.4 glucose or uh, galactose or mannose are much higher than sialic acid so we can have this reverse of the binding affinity and promote the targeting of uh, cancer cells. So we designed this uh, polymeric micelle system. This system contains the drug dahaplatin which is a derivative of uh, oxaliplatin, and we use the traditional conventional phenylboronic acid or the 5-boronopicolinic acid on the surface. And we pick a tumor model of head and neck cancer that comparable to the ones that we are studying in the clinic. And in this case, we have a tumor that has 50% uh, of cancer stem cells, and these cancer stem cells have high levels of uh, sialic acid expression, as we can see here in the uh, yellow color in the staining. So these uh, uh, treatments resulted in the high anti-tumor efficacy of the 5-boronopicolinic acid compared to the other formulations and the 5-boronopicolinic acid promoted the survival of mice. So we can use this type of ligand uh, to increase the delivery uh, by uh, using this type of uh, boronic acid, sialic acid interaction. So this is my last slide. I would like to thank the members of my lab, the uh, members in uh, Professor Kataoka Group at uh, Innovation Center of Nanomedicine, uh, my foreign collaborators, my collaborators in Japan, and funding agencies uh, that make all this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Horacio, for the exciting lecture. Um, now, Rudolf, Thanks. I have to admit, I also don't see any questions. So are there any questions from the audience in this session? Ah, oh, couple. Who want there? Yeah, Rainer, then. I, I'm just curious about this very interesting boronic acid uh, binder okay. that can uh, form a very good complex with uh, sialic acid, yeah? Um, yes. Now, what is the origin of this increased uh, binding strength? Hmm. Yeah, it's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, we are trying to identify the mechanism of binding. Um, we have uh, two hypotheses. One is a uh, charge interaction with the carboxylate in sialic acid. Um, there is a group in uh, France uh, that showed long time ago that phenylboronic acid can uh, interact by this mechanism. Uh, in our group, we ha have identified uh, hydrogen bonding promoted with uh, uh, sialic acid. So mm. this allows us to not only target uh, sialic acid that is on the end group of the glycan, but also sialic acid that is in the, uh, also in the middle of the, of the glycan. So we see that we, we can target both. So it's not only the, the charge interaction. So uh, probably I, I personally don't both. believe in a charge interaction at 150 
millimolar mm. sodium chloride for yeah. single charge. Yeah. You need yeah. multiple, then you have a chance. But for single, it would not work. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I also. But the hydrogen I, bonding might probably, probably be there is some some simultaneous hydrogen bonding uh, plus uh, charge. I I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Paul. Mm. Yeah, very nice. I, I, I wasn't aware of this either. Um, uh, relate to the binding of the carbohydrate. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not. It's not. I mean, you're not targeting a receptor, so I, I guess you can decorate no. cells. But the question then is, yeah. uh, what about the uptake? Is that it, is that just then due to accumulation? You have a higher density because just because mm -hmm. just binding to the surface doesn't give you uptake, right? How yeah. So any information about this. <laughs> so we, so far we, we just target the uh, glycans, so it's a general targeting of sialic acid and because cancer cells present overexpression of sialic acid, uh, we just get enhanced uh, uptake by retention on the cell surface. Um, we are looking now on glycan arrays and we, see, we noted that uh, the targeting is uh, not random, there is some specific glycans that can be targeted by by using this uh, fiboron or picolinic acid so we we are now uh, looking into that uh, possibility so not not only cancer cells but also promote uh, targeting to t cells or other uh, type of cells that have a specific glycan structures yes okay thank you very much once again in the intro interest of time we have to move on and the next talk will be by my co-chair, or by the chair, actually, of this session, I have to say, by Rudolf Zentl. And he will, <coughs> excuse me, and he will tell us, um, now maybe now I can say that, about the end of protein corona, or a more rational description of the protein corona. And I'm very, very happy to listen to this talk. Also, I may know the outcome. Rudolf, uh, I'm just I'm looking uh, forward see. to your talk. So, Matthias, thanks very much. I think he's also very well. In, in this paper has many authors, and Matthias is also one of them. So uh, we were working for a longer time on the problem, is protein corona in plasma an intrinsic property of all nanoparticles? Maybe this is just if today you, write, you read a paper and they all start from any nanoparticle you put into the body will form a dense protein corona. And let's look at it. And I think the one, the student who made most of the work really is Irina Alberg. Now, let's say what is known. Uh, many systems which have uh, what I call a hard interface or a sharp interface form protein corona. These are all the inorganic nanoparticles, gold, silica, but it's also polystyrene or so. And now if the surface is covered with proteins, it changes the biological identity of a particle because the body will look first from the outside and it changes biodistribution and many properties. Now, the thing is that by far not all nanoparticles, especially the ones you use for biomedicine, possess this sharp interface. If you look for, below for something like uh, polymeric micelles, if you look for liposomes, polymersomes, or if you look for polymer brushes, they have a diffuse interface. And on the other hand, they are rather interesting as carriers and not so much work has been done on them. I think the answer is quite simple. I think just with systems with a hard interface, we usually have a higher density and these particles are separated from plasma with which they are incubated by centrifugation. Right. And so first is you need a good method to separate these particles with a soft corona from plasma because you first have to put them into plasma and then they separate. And a good method to do this is asymmetrical flow, field flow, fractionation. And I think here in Cleanum, we have an advertisement of a company who sells it, who also tells you how great this method is. 
just a few words about it. In asymmetrical flow field flow fractionation, you have a channel in it for something flows with including all the particles you have in it, you have a parabolic flow profile. And in addition to this, you have a membrane. And because of a membrane, you have a cross flow and the cross flow presses all larger particles to this membrane. Now, on the other hand, you have diffusion and small particles diffuse faster than big particles. So small particles will be more in the middle of this flow and flow quicker and <clears throat> large particles will flow slower. So you have separation by hydrodynamic radius from small to large. What comes out is quite opposite to GPC. You first see the small particles and then you see the big ones. The interesting thing is if in the setup you have a low shear force, you have low interaction of membranes, you can analyze what comes out after uh, and do further investigation. So in fact, we did three sets of experiments, four sets of experiments. At first you do this asymmetric field flow field fractionation, just to separate the particles from the plasma. And at the same time, you get information on how big they are afterwards. When we do dynamic light scattering, that's in analysis one. When we do SDS page to look for small fractions of proteins which may come together. And then we do a refined LCMS workflow field, which has been developed by Stefan Tenzer, who is very active in this field. Now let's go to the first part, or the first particles we looked at. And to get a broader idea, we looked at three systems which we had at hand, which are all interesting. The left and the right side, you have particles which in, form, in fact present polymer micelles with a cross-linked core. This is a PEC nanoparticle from Crystal Therapeutics, also loaded with a drug on the left. Then it is a block core polymer from, poly, from PHMPA uh, as a classical polymer, which is photochemically cross-linked in the core. And then we have polysarcosine nanobrushes from Matthias Bartz, which are in fact really individual single polymers, but of a large size. And the core of them, which we use for shielding is quite different. It's polyethylene glycol, it's polysarcosine, or it's polyhydroxypropyl methylcrylate. Now, what do we observe if we look at these materials? And at first I should say that uh, there are typical measurements during AF4 without aggregation and typical measurements with aggregation. Without aggregation, I will explain this a little bit in detail. What you get is at first you adjust plasma. When you see at the beginning, you see nothing. When you see the plasma and then you see nothing again with time. So this is just Plasma of proteins in plasma are much smaller than our nanoparticles. If you take our nanoparticles in PBS buffer, which is a green curve, you see nothing in the area of the plasma. And then you see the nanoparticles, and then you still see not much more. And if we have uh, nanoparticles incubated in plasma, you get the blue curve, which says you see the plasma and separated from the plasma, you see the nanoparticles. But the size of nanoparticles is of the same size, independent of if they come, if, I, if you characterize them from PBS buffer or from plasma diluted when run with PBS plus, uh, buffer. On the other hand, if you have systems which show an aggregation, then again, this blue curve, it shows you that you see the plasma, you see some traces of the nanoparticles and you see larger aggregates. So obviously something happens. And when if you are uh, systems which are forming extreme protein plasma, in this case, it are polystyrene nanoparticles solubilized with uh, a PEC 
tensite. When you see here, just for the nanoparticles in PBS, you see the nanoparticles. And if you have the nanoparticles in plasma, this is the blue curve, you see nothing in the range of nanoparticles, but you see there is something very, very late if you clean your column. So these are example of large aggregates which are formed. Now, what are the three systems we have? And they are presented here. The spec nanoparticles, polysarcosine brushes, and our PHPMA nanoparticles, they all belong to this class where, in fact, you do not see a big sign of aggregation. And you see the particle again in this red box. And the maximum is clearly just in the same area where you observe uh, maximum before incubation in plasma. This is as it cannot be a massive protein aggregation. Now, to look closer at this, say we just collected this area and Miss Everett box and Miss Alberg made then dynamic light scattering experiments. And for results, you see below and you see the particle in PBS, maybe it's 34 nanometers. Particle incubated in plasma is 30. And I think, in fact, you see always the same size, where biomass say that this one nanometer, this is at the end the accurateness of the material. So it may be that it changes by one nanometer, but this may be the same, in fact. So it's a direct proof that there is not much protein aggregation. Now we must say these particles have a size of 20 to 40 nanometer. A protein may be one nanometer, so one protein maybe that you do not see it. So we went on. And here to show again this problem, what you see in this red box is that obviously we do not have 100% of separation with AF4 from between the plasma and the particles. In, if you look for the blue curve, you see that uh, the intensity of plasma is not zero if you enter this box. So you expect that there is a little bit of co -illusion. So you have to compare. Now we do SDS page. The first thing is we only see in this area any signs of proteins if we go for silver staining. Silver staining is very sensitive. It's nanomolar. If we do silver staining, we see proteins. We see the same proteins for all the samples and the thing is, these proteins we see, they are in all probability ser human serum albumin, which is mostly uh, present in serum. And on the left side, you see one, two, three slices. They are nanoparticles incubated with serum. And on the right side, you see just serum run after the uh, AF4. And you see the same. This means we had this, we compare the green and the blue curve. And yeah, okay, we see always the same proteins. Now, in order to get a feeling of how much proteins we detect, we made here, uh, uh, we just made SDS page runs of uh, serum albumin. And here on the left side, you just have different concentrations of serum albumin. And here's what we get together with a brush. And then we calculate of how much we have here and we compared it to the your protein. And we calculate that we get about five to 10 nanogram. And if you then calculate of how much we had in, we weighed it, we find that we have less than one human serum albumin per nanoparticle which means most of the nanoparticles cannot have anything. And we know that this, at least a great part of the human serum albumin just comes from something which is co -eluted. Now, to get a really very clear characterization of it, we went to Stefan Tenzer and did mass spectrometry. And I must say with mass spectrometry, you see anything. I think. If you smoked, you say, if you had some drugs 
I think we had this who was it, we had this football coach. And he said, I didn't take drugs and he gave a hair. And they made smart mass spectrometry from the hair and they found that a month earlier he had had some drugs. So with mass spectrometry, you see nearly, you always see something, nearly if you have anything. But here we have to compare the system just if you have a serum in this fraction, when the protein, and we also looked at the samples, say the protein, this is for red curve, and we look at just for pure nanoparticles. And then we find something really interesting. At least we see uh, proteins which are enriched compared to pure plasma. So this is something which is not co eluding Then we see systems which are compared to pure nanoparticles, because what turns out our nanoparticles are dirty. For example, our nanoparticles typically contain a little bit of carotene. Carotene is from the fingers of a student who handle the beakers. And only things which are compared under both conditions, which is when this orange part here considers for a plasma corona. And now these people, in, so this is always the smallest parts. And now the people in mass spectrometry, they can compare the mass of different proteins we observe. And so we find that 30 to 40% of all proteins are serum albumin, but serum albumin clearly is not upregulated. And what you have as this orange part here, the one which is upregulated according to both controls, this is 1%, maybe close to 20% at maximum, 1%. And say even with 20% compared to 40% of serum albumin means it's at maximum is half of the amount of serum albumin we find. And serum albumin is much less than one protein per nanoparticle, which just says most of the proteins we detect are coeluting and most of the nanoparticles are not associated with a single protein. I do not want to say that this is true for all particles of size, but obviously it says while for nanoparticles with a heart interface, protein corona is something which is very intensely observed. If you take the right, maybe lucky systems, which are a core densely coated with a hydrophilic, strongly hydrated shell, you may have no protein formation, no corona formation. And this is for news. Thanks for listening to me. Okay. Thank you very much, Rudolf. I just heard from the organizers, we have to move on immediately. So I would like to switch all discussion to our channel afterwards. Yep. Okay. This is all true for all the talks. I apologize for that, but we are late. So we yep. will move on now. Yep. So it's again, ah, it's my great pleasure to hand over the microphone to Maria Vicent, yeah, my former postdoc supervisor. Maria, it's, it's always a pleasure uh, listening to your talks. And um, therefore, we are more than happy to hear from you today. Um, about polypeptide-based um, conjugates as versatile, I should say, polymer therapeutics. Let me share the screen. Thank you very much, Matthias. It's really a pleasure uh, being here. And, and I'm really enjoying this session uh, because uh, I... Um, I, it's my first time in clinic, so I was not really sure how to do that. In only, like, you know, I'm talking a lot, so in only 12 minutes, it's difficult to tell what you want to say. So I guess for the rest of the people, it's, it's the same. But uh, you've been making introduction for, for my presentation, so, so I, I really uh, will not have any problems. So, um, you know, we in the lab, we are working on... Uh, uh, first, also, thank you, Rudolf and Matthias and, and Beth to, 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 to really uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. So, in the lab, we are working on unmet clinical needs. 
Uh, and uh, we, what we are working on is we are chemists, we are biologists, so we are having a very interdisciplinary uh, approach because the way we are thinking uh, to do this uh, or to approach these therapeutic uh, needs is kind of understanding what the patients uh, are requiring, talking to clinicians and, and understanding this heterogeneity and trying to understand also which chemical tools we are we we can we, we can use to make this this therapeutics um, uh, a reality and these chemical tools we have to characterize properly because when we are talking about making nanomedicine as you nicely show all the issues with all the characterization it's very important not only the identity but also how these nanosystems we present to biological membranes to 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 really bypass if we have targeting residues or not and really we have to consider all these aspects as a whole uh, in the design. So we are using a lot of AF4 now uh, to really try and to, to, to understand or to also analyze our systems in physiological fluids to get identity, to get solution conformation behavior, but also we are uh, we are really uh, characterizing the preclinical models that we are using and trying to use those that help us to understand the process and to also in the way to to um, identify phys uh, physical descriptors also biomarkers to be sure that this translation and trying to really this iterative approach is every time more uh, efficient and, and goes faster. So we are focusing on, on using 2D and 3D models uh, that is also from patients, mainly for cancer, that we are really interested in total met of metastatic tumors, uh, for example. We are using a lot of uh, high throughput screening approaches like cell painting, looking at morphology, but also we are looking at the specific molecular targets inside the cells that are ruling endocytosis or cell trafficking that is a key parameter for, for our polymer therapeutic but also um, uh, others that uh, is really um, will help us to find these biomarkers of this of this uh, or these uh, physical chemical descriptors. When we move to in vivo, also we we are trying to the same. We try to understand which in which models we are working on. Uh, so trying to understand if it is a tumor model vascularization, uh, how metastasis progressing, how this uh, uh, will help us to understand biodistribution or, or the fate of our nanosystems. In the lab, we have cancer models, yeah, but we are working in collaboration very closely with people having Alzheimer's models or like models like a spinal cord injury, and each of them has peculiarities. And depending on if we are in the inducing you know, administering the things intranasally or intratically or intravenously, the design of the system is completely different. So there's something that we have to really be careful with the design. Today I'm going to show you, uh, you know, I like mostly, we are working with other type of cargos, but we like a lot of small drugs and we saw very nice examples of the importance of the linking chemistry with, with Julian. And we are also, uh, the examples I will show you today is the importance of this rational design where the carrier is important. And if we are looking at chronic administration, it's very important we have biodegradability uh, as, as we are working on neurodegenerative. That's why we selected polypeptides, and we like them a lot. Uh, polypeptides, polypeptoids, they are uh, endogenous, they are degrading in endogenous materials, and they are multivalent. They are really nicely formed for small drugs. But also, we have to be very careful how we select the, the drugs. Like, uh, we are mainly working with combination of drugs and how we link them. We use mainly post-polymerization modification approaches, but uh, uh, it can be also done, um, as, as Julian was saying, also the other way around, having a semi-seator. And we are starting working with active targeting because we agree with Horacio that is the way forward. So we be, most of the examples that we show you will be EPR based, but uh, we are really also having an open up many, many projects in the lab with looking at these active targeting approaches. We use polypeptides and, uh, because uh, um, we end up with a, with a technology that uh, Mattia was part of it when he was doing the postdoc in my lab, that uh, we were lucky to license to PTS, is the company on Valencia, that they, now they put in place uh, uh, the capability of producing these materials and that GMP on large scale. So what is really helping us to understand or to, to have a background uh, security that uh, the, what we do in the lab is we will be able to be manufactured and to scale up. The key issue here is to use, uh, we use uh, ring opening polymerization for, uh, from uh, NCA 
and, and carboxyan hydrax. And the key issues here for the for controlling uh, this process is to have a high quality monomer to start with the, the process and then to really control uh, this polymerization process from all the parameters. In that case, we can also play with uh, different architectures and uh, we can produce linear, star shape, brands. We are different sites because we are really working with a living polymerization. We like a lot working on, on uh, brand systems now because we, ha we found out that uh, it gives us a lot of more uh, capabilities with, uh, with playing with the solution conformation. And coming from Paul's uh, old lab, like, uh, Maya's lab, uh, we started with uh, using BTA as macro initiator. And instead of uh, having like a small uh, branches, we, the first one we did was with a large, uh, with a large um, polypeptide branch, like 50 units. And we found that in modulating the concentration that, uh, of this uh, star-shaped polyglutamase, we could tune the size, but also we can change completely the zeta potential going for more negatively charged that allow us to control which cells we are looking at. And this is based on, on a transition behavior called ordinary to extraordinary because we are generating a very highly dense electrostatic interactions with the electrons and the counterion ions that this form a transient dipole that are very strong. Uh, so using this behavior, we can really modify in or, or playing with the hydrophobic hydrophilic ratio of our, our system, we can really change the size and the shape of our, of our materials. So we are now uh, having systems that are can going from, from supramolecular 1D, uh, supramolecular assemblies, uh, um, similar to uh, what Paul was showing, um, that um, when we are changing the contour and ion, we can have really long fibers that we are using for spinal cord injured. We have a discrete nano rods, or we have with longer branches, where we have a very flexible core that we have system and collapse, and then we have spheres that are the classical ones that we are mainly working on for uh, systemic administrations. So uh, Alex was systematically uh, um, understanding using different hydrophobic cores with different spacer with different peptides and also uh, different charges and end up with a nice uh, morphology diagrams where all these kind of materials we are trying to understand where uh, we use them or how how to take profit of this versatility mainly working with polypeptides for topical administration systemic or different type of functionalities. These systems are very, I used to say, for example, if we rely on these electrostatic interactions to go systemically, we need to, to, to cover and entrap them. So, so for that uh, purposes, we fun pre-functionalize uh, the, the universe before cross-linking either with orthogonal functionalities or, or just uh, having um, drugs already in there. We cross-link to, to um, stabilize the systems to be sure that we can, we can work with the systematic systemically. So we can put the drugs before or afterwards. So it depends on how we link the drugs and which linker we use. We can really tune the release kinetics and uh, depending on the drugs are inside the crosslink sphere or we are functionalizing them in the outer part, we are really changing the therapeutic output because we are changing the release kinetics of the drugs. Usually we use the outer part to conjugate targeting moieties or antigens, for example, when we, when we work in vaccination or we are modifying also so they are the branches of the systems, for example, with Thai also, we have a lot much larger architectures and we are using them for uh, intranasal delivery. So these systems, depending on, on, on the size and uh, we have different, different biodistribution, different fate. So the cross-link system, because they are larger, all of them are highly negatively charged, but they are all renally excreted and we have the profit of this, this renal tropism. So we are opening out of projects on renal tropism. I'll show you one example now. And also we have a very strong line of research in immunotherapy in vaccination with Elena Florindo and Hector Peinado that we show in really nice uh, antigen presentation of, of uh, in, in our carrier because it's flexible and it's, it's, it's hydrophilic. So the way uh, the, this is presenting the antigen to the antigen presented cells is very, very interesting. So the drugs, we are linking them depending on if it is uh, um, non-biodegradable for um, um, 
imaging probes of our targeting moiety, or we are using, really using different type of peer responsive and cell responsive or redox responsive like self-emulative link and chemistry for different applications. So for the renal tropism, and, and we conjugated, for example, this curcumin as an anti-inflammatory antioxidative drug that uh, in, in this cross-link system uh, through an ester bone, and we found in an acute model of inflammation, for example, because of this high accumulation in the kidney, that we have a re significant reductions of plasma and urea levels in the blood, much, much nicer uh, outcome without a prevention of uh, cell death or activation of caspases or a, a reduction of the markers or the stress. This is in collaboration with Adrian Ramos in, in the CSIC in Madrid. So we, we have this playing with the, with the tropism to an organ. Uh, we are focus, uh, focusing on the linking chemistry, what uh, is very, very important for us, and is more important when, you, when we work with combination therapy, we have to really tune the release kinetics of the drug in the different time frames, when making them by available in a, in a specific ratio. So in projects that we have in, in cancer, metastatic cancer, for example, we are targeting um, drugs that are in the clinical scenario with drugs that are um, targeting release of exosomes, for example. We use HTS approach to select this ratio of the drugs and we are having a different type of linkers. So, for example, with a combination of drugs that uh, uh, we demonstrated that having both in the same carrier is important. Different ratio is also important, but having a protease lab Portuguese labile linker in comparison with PH labile linker, we can enhance the activity having a PH labile linker for doxorubicin, for example, that was a high reason compared to a peptide linker. In all cases, we have a nice um, uh, toxicity uh, safety with the cardio applications, but uh, in the case of we have greater or smaller accessibility of the doxorubicin, we are also changing the release kinetics of the doxo. So having a longer linker with the hydrazone compared to a shorter linker, the longer link linker gave us a much faster release of the doxo and this yield to a, a small hydrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, sorry. So therefore we continue uh, the studies with the, with the shorter hydrazone linker. And having also a PS labile is allowing us to release the drug already into a microenvironment, and this is giving us really nice data in metastatic tumors. So this, this data is on, was only observed with the, the compounds that uh, we are able to release the doxo already with the pH and have almost complete diminishing and reduction in the, in the lungs or, and the lymph nodes. Uh, we, we want to target and we have metastasis in the brain. We are using, for example, LRP1 targeted with uh, angiopep. Uh, we are linking angiopep to, to the surface of the cross-link system through a bisulfide bond. Angiopep, LRP1 receptor is overexpressed in, 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 in situation where we have metastasis in the brain and that's we are using them. Having this peptide, we are able to overpass the, the bovine barrier. It's a collaboration with Manuel Valiente and also Go, looking deeply to this, uh, with this targeting uh, after IV administration, what we found with the system is we have a nice distribution in the whole brain vasculature. We have mainly go into olfactory valve and hippocampus, and we are able to extravasate and go intracellularly through endocytosis pathway and co-localize with the lysosome. Knowing that they are going to the olfactory bulb and also uh, to the hippocampus, uh, com combining drugs, not in the cancer scenario, but in the more neurodegenerative disorders as anti-inflammatory and, and um, neuroprotective neurorescuer, we, we were able to conjugate, for example, with curcumin with some uh, more inhibitors that are able to completely re uh, recover the olfactory capacity. That is one of the features that the Alzheimer patients lost the most compared to the free drugs, combining both of them in a, in a conjugate after IV with this LP1 targeted, we are able to have much nicer recovery with the animals. So very fast. Uh, so it's like I show you that, uh, I hope to show you this is uh, very, Quickly examples that uh, the versatility of the pep polypeptides, but Matthias showed you many, and also Paul and, and Julian also showed you, showed you many examples where we can do with the polypeptides and also Horacio. And, um, and this is really thanking all the group that was making the work and uh, all the collaborators and funding agencies. And thank you so much for, for, for the opportunity again. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much. And uh, please. Keep all your questions in mind for the channel later on, and we'll come to the next talk. 
um, Alexander Salakim will uh, basically switch gears slightly and will tell us about uh, Brodrug and polymer Brodrug synthesis. Um, so Alex, the stage is yours. Thank you, Matthias. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Perfect. So, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a great conference. Thanks to, to the organizers for actually doing a great job in making it happen. Indeed, I'll talk to you about prodrugs, and prodrugs are molecules. I know it's an anime medicine conference. Uh, I really love molecules more than nano objects. Molecules in my hands are easier to reproduce, to characterize, to work with. But on the other hand, the barriers we deal with are the same as you deal with uh, using tools of nano medicine. We talk about targeting, solubility, stability, etc. We specifically focus on molecules, on prodrugs, and prodrugs we use specifically to do localized drug synthesis. We've come to this field from uh, actually uh, dealing with biomaterials. Uh, if you look at the three scenarios of drug delivery, you can use pills, and this is what I call naked drug delivery. So you, it's very convenient. Uh, you, if the red pill doesn't work for you, you can take a blue pill, you can take two together, you can double the, uh, the amount of drugs you take, but there's no targeting. Okay, there's antibody drug conjugates, and then you have very good targeting. Uh, it is expensive, and still, if you look at it, just about 1% of the deliverable dose actually gets to where it belongs to. So there's a third opportunity, and that is the localized drug delivery. Cardiovascular stents, hydrogel beads, they deliver drugs locally where you implant your biomaterial. Therein is the strength of this technology, but there is also weaknesses because only the drug you put on into the biomaterial can you release. So you cannot change the drug, you cannot uh, change the dose. So this is very inflexible technology. And we really wanted to merge the two or get the best of the two worlds and merge them into the same concept. And so what we did was uh, we came up with the enzyme product therapy that we engineered into the biomaterials. So instead of doing drug delivery, we do drug synthesis. So it's the same hydrogel B that you can do as an implantable biomaterial. And we embed into it the tools of uh, biosynthesis, so enzymes. Then we can uh, add the corresponding prodrug, and this will be converted by the enzyme that is our element of drug synthesis. Now, the enzyme can convert not just one prodrug, but all the prodrugs on the same protecting group. So glucuronidase will convert all the glucuronides. And for that reason, I can change from glucuronide of SN38 to another drug or take the two together or in sequence. And that is a very flexible technology. And over the past decade, we've engineered this into uh, hydrogel beads, into electrospun fibers for cardiovascular applications for in the surface coatings. And we really, I, th I believe, we succeeded in merging the and uh, taking the best of the two worlds from conventional chemotherapy. We take changeable dose again because the same enzyme can uh, uh, can convert all the prodrugs. And if you take double the dose of prodrug, you make double the dose of the drug. It's a changeable regimen. You can take combination therapy, and you do it locally. You synthesize the, uh, the drug locally where you have your enzyme. Our greatest contribution, I believe, was actually in the design of prodrugs, and this is what we've dealt with uh, quite a fair bit. And then while we were dealing with the biomaterials and the drug synthesis, it came to our attention that there are other opportunities, more advanced and simpler in a way at the same time. Because if you look at the body, we actually have scenarios where an enzyme is specifically associated with a disease and accessible in the extracellular space. And such a disease is, for example, cancer. And the same enzyme that we've relied on in our engineering of biomaterials, glucuronidase, in healthy tissues, it's not accessible. It's in the intracellular space. In cancer, it's an extracellular enzyme, or at least there is enough of it in the extracellular space, so much so that you can make cancer detection based on this phenomenon. So if we now engineer a product that cannot get into the cells and cannot reach the glucuronidase in the intracellular space in healthy tissues, we will only have this drug conversion, prodrug conversion, and therefore drug synthesis only associated with the tumor. And then the big challenge would be how to ensure that we have enough prodrug get into the cancer. So we've engineered prodrugs based on this extended scaffold glucuronide. So this is your glucuronic acid as a protective group. And when it's removed, this is a self immolative link and we will release the drug. Glucuronides are very polar, so they do not get through the lipid bilayer of the cell. So they cannot reach into the, healthy, uh, into the healthy cells where you have glucuronidase inside the cell. How do we ensure enough payload of the product to get into cancer? We can in, in, uh, use macromolecular prodrugs or supramolecular prodrugs, in which case these are albumin binders. And as a drug, we use MMAE, that is ultra potent, such that even a few molecules we synthesize within tumor would actually exert a strong uh, anti-proliferative anti effect. 
So this is to show that indeed glucuronides are very good prodrugs. The fold ratio of toxicity for prodrug and the drug is over a hundred. So it is a safe therapy. So it's very well tolerated in mice, for example. Uh, when we take uh, tumors and cut them out and put glucuronides for imaging reagents, you see that the solution lights up. That means we actually can reach the glucuronidase. And indeed, one of the prodrugs was superior as an anti-cancer mono uh, agent. And I'll refer to our paper for you to see which one it was. We took a step on and realized that in our hands, we have something very, very interesting and important. And this is a work in submission. Uh, we applied this product technology now to associate it not with albumin, but with the cells. So we can engineer cells. Why do we need to do it? You've heard, I'm sure, a lot of talks in this conference about cell engineering, CAR-T methodology, etc. There is a need to communicate to these cells, and we would love to establish such a route of communication through a dedicated route so that we make an artificial receptor and we can communicate to the engineered cell dedicatedly when we need it. So what we made was, we, you will recognize the general feature of our prodrug, only now we're associated with the cell. We make this lipid anchor. What are the similarities with receptors? We have exophacial group for uh, triggering. Uh, we have the group that would be released and act as a secondary messenger for intracell effects. But instead of a protein that acts as a receptor, in this case, we have cell formulative linker that is the um, chemical mechanism for signal transduction. And that's the synthesis of how we made it. And to show as a proof of concept how this works, we can take goose negative cells. If we engineer our receptor onto into the lipid bilayer, which you do by just adding a drop of uh, the receptor solution, you can make the cells that are happy, they live, they form, for example, spheroids, and they live uh, for extended times without noticing the artificial receptor. But then when we need to trigger, we can add glucuronidase externally, and you see we address these cells and we kill those cells. So say you engineer that into the CAR-T, should there be a side effect, you can safely deactivate those cells by just addition of a protein. There's another opportunity, and that is uh, to use these cells as a Trojan horse, if you will, because these engineered cells, they are full of this glucuronide uh, prodrug. If we now mix it with a cell population that can activate uh, the glucuronide prodrugs, and these are just healthy cells, the receptor can be actually shared from the engineered cells to the healthy cells. And without any triggering event, we actually have uh, cell deactivation. This can be useful if we engineer these uh, gluconite products to the tumor targeting cells. So therefore, these cells would bring the drug with them as they reach the tumor. Now, having made this type of receptors, we actually wanted to do something else, and we wanted to make artificial internalizing receptors. There's a lot of talks uh, in this conference about targeting. Again, how nice would it be if we could target cells through a receptor that does not exist on any other cell, completely orthogonal? And such a methodology actually exists. We can nominate a haptan. In our case, we love fluorescein, not only because you can raise antibodies to it, but it's also fluorescent. You can see it. It turns out that if you install fluorescein on the cell surface using cholesterol amine, it would be on the cell surface and would go into the cell and back to the cell surface due to this cholesterol amine. And this has been known before we came around. So what we wanted to do is actually we made three different types of uh, these cholesterol amine containing receptors and we also made DSP initially almost like a control, but then it turned out it works very well. You see the, uh, these artificial receptors easily inst installed into the mammalian cells and you can uh, reach them by the corresponding antibody. Novelty of our work specifically is that we made antibody drug conjugates, learning from brentoxamide ability. Look at the potency of this drug delivery. We talk about nanomolar potency of drug delivery using artificial chemical synthetic receptors. And not only this, you can easily install this into primary CD4 positive T cells that are otherwise very hard to target. So CD4 receptor is not internalizing, so therefore targeted drug delivery through CD4 does not work, but with these artificial chemical receptors, we can have nanomolar potency, we have full population uh, uh, that is addressable. And if you consider what is our artificial receptor, unlike the CAR-T methodology, unlike the uh, gene modification and the uh, chimeric receptors, these molecules we install at just about a thousand Dalton. The protocol for installation is just solution-based, so it's minimum, uh, minimal cell handling and we have nanomolar potency in primary T cells. So we're very excited about it and we're developing it for both biotechnology and biomedicine. As a last slide, I'd love to acknowledge 
my students and uh, postdocs whom I owe it to, uh, they do the wonderful job. And I also very much love the Danish landscape for funding science. And once again, thanks for the organizers for inviting me to this conference. Thanks, Matthias. Thank you very much, Alex. It was a great talk, a totally different aspect. So I think we have to talk about that later on. But now I would like to come briefly and directly to the last talk of, um, of our session which will be given by Christopher Scott um, from the Queen's University of Belfast. So therefore, Chris, the stage is yours. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope I can get through this uh, quickly for you. So um, just following on some of the stuff that was, uh, was covered earlier today, uh, my work focuses really on, on antibodies and, and nanoparticles. Sometimes in my career, I can't work out whether I want to work in antibodies or nanoparticles, so I just try to combine the two. The, uh, the, the reason that we're interested in antibody nano, con nano, nanoparticle conjugates is, though, that we feel that they, our, our lab feels that they offer many um, advantages over a standard ADC format, such as the fact that you you can get such a higher drug loading with particles. You don't need the complicated linker directly to the, the antibody. And uh, you can also then have a controlled release effect. And of course, then you can actually enhance drug safety by having it encapsulated within a nanoparticle. Now, can nanoparticles enhance uh, targeting? This is, of course, the uh, the debate that has gone on for, for 10 years or so. And certainly you can take uh, a, a standard antibody like a, a cetuximab and you can show enhanced uh, enhanced binding, enhanced cytotoxicity, delivering the chemotherapy. And this is, is here, camptothecan. And certainly then when we go in vivo, we can see uh, a, 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 some marginal but significant effect on the ability to target the, uh, the nanoparticle. So I'm firmly in a camp that believes that, uh, you know, passive targeting is the, is, is the key step. And then once you get the, uh, the, uh, the targeted nanomedicine to the tumor site, then you have the opportunity to do something. Now, one of the, uh, the areas that we're interested in is how we can uh, use avidity. And for a number of years, we have looked at uh, the, the death receptor 5 pathway. And we've shown uh, uh, in a number of papers, actually, that if you, if you take the free antibody, the death receptor 5, is um, it, it's it's quite happy. It does not um, the, the bis, uh, a bivalent uh, antibody does not provide the cross-linking effect that's really needed in vivo to, to drive the uh, the activation of death receptor five, which causes Caspase eight activation. And this has been, you know, these, these antibodies have been made by various companies um, and taken forward into clinical trials, and they showed poor effects in vivo. There's some, some um, evidence to suggest that FC gamma receptor uh, presentation uh, of the antibody from an, uh, an adjacent cell can drive this activation. We wanted to see, therefore, can you uh, put the antibody onto the surface of the nanoparticle? And yes, when we do that, we know that we can get a, a, a real enhancement of cell death. As you can look here in a range of, of, of quite uh, resistant cell lines, just looking at uh, the um, cell titer glow, the, the effect on cell viability when, an, when the antibody is presented on the surface of the nanoparticle. So no other drug involved in this uh, nanoconjugate. It is simply just the, the avidity effect. So uh, I guess my thesis then is that targeting is useful, but it's even better than when you can actually do something with it. And we can see that in vivo here, some pancreatic xenograft models. And we know that when we put the DR5 antibody onto the surface of the nanoparticle, we're getting a, a really significant uh, uh, improvement in efficacy, which is just not down to targeting. But in this case, it's down to its pro-apoptotic activity. So... That's, um, that's, that's, that's the sort of background uh, to, to the story of what we do. Um, and, and what we're interested in, I'm just going to talk about a couple of things very quickly today, is there alternative conjugation approaches that we can use to, to malamide or, or carbidinamide chemistry. And I have a picture here of, a of, well, in the UK, we, it depends what country you're in, it could be an Irish 
fry, it could be an English fry, it could be a Scottish fry. But this is back in the good old days when we were able to meet together, have a chat, and either over a beer or in this instance it was breakfast, I met this guy called Vijay Tomasana and I realised that he was doing some very, very clever work with click chemistry and uh, with constrained uh, alkenes and copper, copper-free uh, chemistry. So we wanted to see could we actually work with VJ and could we generate next generation antibody uh, nanoparticle conjugates. So what we were doing in this, this work really was saying, okay, up to now I have shown you pictures of nanoparticles of the antibody displayed beautifully, like a little Y on the front of the, on the, on the, on the corona. Oh, that's a bad word, corona, uh, on the surface of the nanoparticle. But in reality, that's not what happens. It's all over the place. And uh, this would be the same whether you're using the malamide chemistry, the same whether you're using, particularly using carbidinamide chemistry. We wanted to see, can we actually orientate the paratopes of the antibodies better and what effect does that have? To do that, then we were, we were working with VJS group. They were looking at disulfide rebridging chemistries that they were able to introduce these, uh, these cross-linkers with a constrained alkene. And then on our nanoparticles and in our systems, we're just using a, a, a PLGA blend setup where we would uh, have a cell surface azide moiety and to see could we get a, a, a click, uh, a conjugation with this approach. And because we were doing it through this disulfide on a fab fragment, the, the thesis then would be that uh, the paratope would be uh, arranged properly on the surface of the particle. Bottom line is it works and it works an absolute treat in comparison to other chemistries. And what we could see here is that this is a, a, a plate with a HER2 protein on it. And we're just looking at um, um, uh, SPR results. And what you could see here is that if we take our nanoparticle, uh, what we call the, the, the native trans, transitizumab herceptin, and uh, we put and we incubate that against the, the HER2 on, on the chip. We could see that it works. This is just a carbidinamide chemistry, but yet if we use the click chemistry, look at the difference here. Okay. Now you're going to ask me, is it because it's an enhancement of protein conjugation or is it, a, um, is it an enhancement of the, uh, the orientation or, or the controlled orientation of the antibody? And the, the true answer is it's, it's probably a mixture of both. And what we would do, do was that when we looked at this at different uh, levels of uh, or concentrations, different amounts of the nanoparticles, uh, it's very hard to, um, to get exact um, equal amounts of protein onto the surface of the nanoparticles. But if you look here uh, on the left hand side, maybe there's one there at 80 picomoles with the standard carbidinamide chemistry versus one here at 69 uh, picomoles with the click chemistry. You can see the, the enhancement we're seeing. Okay, so it's a combination. Certainly, the the click chemistry is much more finish, efficient than carbidinamide, as we as, as 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 you would expect. But it also then the the orientation effect that we're seeing. So we did this work with transtuzumab. More recently, then we have also looked at sertuximab fab, fab fragments. We've been able to show very very similar effects that uh, the the orientated click chemistry approach is, is far far superior. At um, the ability of the resultant nanoparticle to bind to the surface of, uh, or sorry, to bind to um, EGFR uh, protein on chips. You see it's a dose dependent effect. We can also see then that we can compete it out with free cetuximab. We've also done work uh, using free EG EGFR um, FC protein to show that it, uh, it, it is an EGFR uh, bona fide effect. And when we treat um, when we treat cell uh, colonies with this, we can see a, a major effect, uh, much better than what we were seeing with the original uh, cetuximab uh, work we did on the pancreatic cells. Again, this is a pancreatic cell model here where we're loading the particle up with camptothecan as the as a model chemotherapy, and we can see a great enhancement of uh, of, of 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 preventing um, uh, colony formation. We haven't just stopped at antibodies. We have also worked with a company in Aberdeen in North Scotland uh, called the Lasmogen, who work on shark antibodies. And uh, now they don't like to call them shark antibodies. The, the, the proper name is 
VNARs, uh, variable new antigen receptors. And these are very small, 12 kilodalton molecules. Just look at the size of their comparison to, to fab fragments um, of uh, where they have essentially four CDRs, but they call them CDR1, 3, and then HV4 and, and H, HV2. So these are, um, they work, they're very stable, very stable to pH, very stable to solvents. Uh, they are they prefer to be canyon binders uh, because of the position of the four CDRs, and so there's instances where uh, they can work much better than antibodies. We uh, we, we worked with uh, with with VJ again um, to look at uh, introducing a C terminal uh, a thiol group a group into the. Um, Onto 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 the uh, the, the VNR, which would allow us then to introduce the um, which which would allow us to introduce the linker with the constrained alkene, which allows us then to conjugate to the azide. And when we've done that again, we're seeing much superior effects of this molecule, this VNR binding uh, on on uh, SPR and also uh, modified uh, ELISA uh, measurements than we would do with uh, our carbon our carbonamide uh, chemistry. And again, this in this instance, this was a molecule that was specific for DLL four, uh, a cell surface proangiogenic marker. And again, we could show that this was specific and uh, uh, and DLL four dependent. The where you could use free DLL four to uh, to compete out the binding. So. In, in a nutshell, then, uh, disulfide rebridging can be exploited to, to, to refine nanoparticle design. I think that it offers an opportunity to enhance the homogeneity of targeted nanoparticles, ADCs as well, that we have worked on. Um, by controlling the orientation, the conjugation site of an antibody to a polymer, I think that that's going to facilitate the large-scale manufacturing. It is also possible, though, something I haven't touched on today, that you could have too much avidity. It could be too strong a binder. It could just be uh, like like glue, particularly if you've got a marker that is expressed as, elsewhere in the body. And others have seen this before. But at least with this approach, it allows you to control things uh, uh, better. And um, we also think that it's a very uh, very versatile chemistry, and it can be readily uh, translated to other platforms. As you've seen here, we've moved from antibodies to VNORs, and uh, and it works quite well. So. Hope that's a whistle stop tour, but just like to thank the people at Queen's that have done this work, Michelle Green, uh, Peter Smith, uh, thank my colleagues at uh, UCL uh, VJ and Dan Richards and Joel who did uh, most of this work, and then at the last magen, Dr. Caroline Burrell and, uh, and Laura Ferguson for the supply of the DLL4 specific VNOR. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. Great talk. And the final announcement, because I think our organizers are getting extremely nervous already. So we would meet again straight afterwards, uh, right now, uh, in the debate channel or the debate session two. And then we have briefly time to wrap up some of the talks and discuss a little bit further without having time constraints. Yeah, till soon. Yeah. Thank you see, all. See you on the other side. Thanks for having you here. <laughs>